And um, welcome to the 29th meeting of the Economy Committee. I hope members had a couple of weeks um, nice break there. Um, obviously, some of our members are any of our members attending by? No, actually, everybody who, who yeah. can be here is here. So uh, all members are um, in attendance today um, physically, and but our witnesses will be briefing via video conference. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live, and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the assembly website. Um, just to remind members to mute their tablet devices by pushing F4. Um, so we move on then to item number one. Um, as apologies, we have apologies from Stuart Dixon due to continuing illness, and we've also had apologies from Christopher Stafford, and I think everybody else is here. Yeah, yep. everybody else is here, Chair. Okay, so um, our meeting this afternoon is in relation, obviously, to the outworkings of the A levels. Um, and the, the amended process that is now being used. Obviously, um, this has caused significant stress and anxiety for, for many young people and their families. Um, and the delay in making that decision has caused further stress and anxiety now around um, the process over uh, university admissions and um, college admissions. Obviously, it has been a very difficult time for, for many young people, but there are now outworkings of that that is causing um, issues for our universities and colleges that and we want to hear a wee bit more about that obviously we had hoped that the minister was able to join us this afternoon as well but she wasn't able to make it um, a little bit disappointed that she's not able to be here with us because it would have been really useful to hear about what the discussions were with executive colleagues around all of that because obviously there are implications for for other departments as well as just economy and education um, we are hoping to hear from the regional colleges as well um, perhaps next week, but we're, we'll go into that. There's some information in your packs around um, the impact on the colleges, and we also have some information there from St Mary's and um, Strand Millis. So there's a particular impact for the teaching colleges as well. Um, I think that we will maybe move on and get a, a bit of a briefing from our, our witnesses. There are some issues, obviously, um, that will work out over the course of tomorrow when we get GCSE results around apprenticeships that are also that we may want to explore a little bit with with um, the officials. Um, obviously some additional funding was made available to um, uh, fund apprenticeships and um, it would be useful to get a, a breakdown of that. Obviously young people will be getting their results tomorrow and making some decisions about what they're going to be doing next year so it would be useful to hear um, what is happening in relation to the, the apprenticeship programmes. So um, I will introduce who our, our witnesses are today. We have Heather Cousins, who is Head of Skills and Education at DFE. We have Jim Wilkinson, who is Apprenticeships, Careers and Vocational Education at DFE. And Philip Comey, who is Higher Education, Finance and Strategic Coordination at DFE. Can you all hear us OK? Do we have to say yes. sorry we for... No, no, everybody's in the spotlight, Chair. We just don't seem to be able to see Jim. Jim's having difficulty with his video. It seems to be showing the back of his chair. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah. Can... Mine was earlier, but I clicked something and, and was able to sort it out, but uh, Jim hasn't been able to. OK, well, hopefully he might be able to join us in due course. Um, can but he, he could probably hear us anyway, I think. I think audio works even when video doesn't. But we, we might just proceed then with, with Heather and Philip. Sure. I think she'd probably be able to be able to it all. Okay, Heather, if I hand over to yourself, <coughs> you want to give us an initial briefing? Okay, well, um, I'm not sure that I can necessarily give you very much briefing. Indeed, the committee seems to have more information than we do at this point in time because we have not had uh, papers from St Mary's or Stranmillis. I suppose this is a very unusual year. The department would not normally be involved in the admissions process. Universities and colleges are autonomous. Uh, we give them, obviously, the student number that they can recruit up to, and then normally it is down to the institutions to work through those processes. Now, up with the news about the A-level U-turn, etc., uh, this is when we have been drawn in in terms of hearing from Queen's in particular that there will be a difficulty because of additional places potentially being required. However, at this point in time, we do not have definitive numbers. 
those numbers have yet to get to UCAS and to the universities. So it is going to take a couple of weeks before we actually know what the extent of this problem is and whether it goes right across the higher education sector, which includes the, the teacher education colleges, includes courses in, in medicine and allied professions, uh, and includes uh, the programs that uh, are higher education programs in further education colleges. So we will have to look at the totality of the picture. What we are doing is we are, we are uh, tabling a, a paper to the executive tomorrow to highlight that we may be coming back to the executive with bids for additional places. At this point in time, we don't know how what, what that's going to look like. So you know, I can't give you much detail on that. Um, places at teacher training colleges, it's actually the Department of Education that determines those numbers. We simply then pay for it following on from that. So if there's any additional places required, that will be a decision for the Department for Education. On the health side for medical courses, that will be a decision for uh, the Department of, of Health. So um, th there's still a lot of unknowns. I think what we would say is that we are listening. We will work very closely with universities and colleges to try and navigate our way through this. Um, and you know, we, we would hope that the executive would be sympathetic if there is a need for additional courses or additional places going forward. I have seen in the um, press a lot of calls for the maximum student number cap to be scrapped. Um, I can understand why that is, is being put forward. However, that maximum student number is simply a function of the total budget that we have available for higher education. Um, universities and colleges would not simply be prepared to take on extra students and not get any additional resources. They do um, believe that the funding is required in order to maintain a good quality student experience. So it's not simply a case of taking in additional numbers and doing away with that cap. That cap, as I say, is simply working backwards from the budget that we currently have available. We did, however, earlier this year bid for a 5% uplift in places, um, you know, thinking ahead that more young people may wish to stay and study in Northern Ireland rather than go away. So we have secured an additional number of places and the universities are aware of their allocation of those additional places. I'll stop there and, and wait for questions. Okay, um, I have okay. A in, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Um, just in relation to that final uh, point there, in relation to the 5% uplift in places, has that already been allocated to this year's intake? Yes, it has. Both the universities know what the additional numbers are for those uh, for that extra 5%. Okay, and are you able to give us any, um, I suppose, um, indication of what the universities have indicated in relation to potential numbers above or extra that, that in relation to um, grades that are, are, may be amended? Well, can I say that we actually don't get that information. So I think that, and I, and I know that you will have both universities later on this afternoon, you would be better to ask that question of the universities. And maybe I'll ask Philip to tell you what the additional numbers that we did get and communicate to the universities was. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, sure. I think if I can pick up your, your question correctly, are, are you intimating what the level of um, potential rejections that came about as a result of the change in the A-level grades last week? Because at the moment, obviously, the, the only number that we're aware of really is the, the number that's been circulated in the press of the additional thousand students um, that, that Queen's University had, had indicated. Yes, um, I, th I think that Heather was asking what, what the additional 5% was for each of the universities. So, in, in terms of the additional 5%, so that will over the course of three years, relate to 1,232 additional undergraduate places um, at both universities. Uh, and for, i just bring up the numbers, for this year, um, it will be 410 for uh, 2021. Um, 
So that, that would be a, an additional allocation for, for 2021. I think it's also important to reflect at this point that the maximum student number has also been inflated back to its 2015 level. Um, in 2015-16, there was a, a significant cut to higher education budgets. Uh, the both universities, um, under the direction of the, the previous Minister for Employment and Learning, started a course of reduction of 2,200 places. Um, we've now, uh, uh, for 2020-21, uh, we will see the, the full reintroduction of, of those places back to where they were at. Uh, 2015. Um, so effectively for 2021, there will be uh, an introduction of an additional 1,730 places uh, in higher education. And in relation to that 1,730, is that all being funded by, by the department or is that uplift in relation only to the 410 additional places? <coughs> The, the, in, in terms of additional funding to the universities, it would only be in relation to the the, the 410 um, that that would then sort of flow through over the, the subsequent three years um, to a net requirement of seven million. Um, once the, the the 1,232 places are embedded and, and baselined, um, the the 660, as I say, that's reintroducing numbers that were previously cut. The, on the back of that previous budget cut, uh, money was reintroduced back into higher education, but um, because of the nature of needing to wait until budgets are effectively baselined, uh, there hadn't been the previous uh, decision to reintroduce those numbers. They've been brought back in slowly. So, for example, um, in 1920, there was roughly about an additional 440 uh, students reintroduced and then this year it's the decision has been taken to completely reinflate that back to the, the 2015 level okay so ha had universities then seen an, an uplift prior to the additional places being allocated for this year sorry Chair, can you repeat that had universities seen an uplift in their funding prior to the additional 410 places being added this year when you say that they, they were reintroduced back in 440 in 1920 and additional places this year up to the, the previous 2014 level? So, so whenever the, the decision was, uh, the, I suppose to give you a, a view of the, the teaching grant level within the, the, the two main universities, um, in, at the end of the 2013-14 academic year, uh, the level of teaching grant support was 119.9 million. Uh, at the end of last year, so for, for uh, 1920, again, that level was 119 million. So the decision was, because the, the funding was there, the decision was then uh, taken to, to reinflate those numbers back to what they had been prior to the reductions being made. Okay, okay thanks for that. Um, I guess just in relation to what what we do know, um, and so far that obviously there may be additional places needed, there have been some conversation or some public um, announcements that from both the economy minister and the, the finance minister that they would work to, to look at th that if necessary. Um, Obviously, there is that immediacy in terms of this year. Looking at that over the next few years, has there been any thought to, to how that will work itself out over particularly the next academic year if you know students are deferred out of places this year because they're, they're completely full in some of those courses? Oh, I think you're on mute, Heather. This needs to be uh, looked at in the round. Um, so, you know, we, we will look at it, and not just universities, but it's the entire range of higher education numbers that we need to look at, mm -hmm. um, you know, because there could be surplus places in, in other, in colleges, in Ulster University, and we, we do need to have more information that we just do not have at this point in time. Okay. Great, look, I'll hand over to some members for questions. John Stewart, I think you're first. 
No, thanks, Chair. Nice to get in early. Um, thank you so much for your um, contribution so far. I suppose it is a little bit disappointing, maybe not from your point of view, uh, for, in terms of yourselves, but just that the department itself can't give us more information at this stage. I appreciate that we are quite early down the line, but um, are you, have you been in a position, though, to have any um, conversations with your counterparts in England and Wales about the potential to see um, Barnet consequentials from the decision there to extend the cap? And I know you mentioned that you've seen here people calling for the scrapping. I know myself, I, I put out a press release last week asking for it to be, to be extended, not to be scrapped, but just to be raised so that we could take um, at least um, acknowledge the fact that this is an unprecedented year and that students are put into a very difficult position, as have... Um, further and higher education providers, and that this would acknowledge the fact that these aren't normal circumstances. Um, is that something that has been discussed with counterparts in the mainland about that potential for money? Um, it is highly unlikely there would be a Barnet consequential because in England, students pay a much higher fee, so there isn't a, a teaching grant going to the universities, uh, and, and it is a completely different system, whereas here we have a hybrid model of a teaching grant and fees. Um, those two combined do not add up to the 9,000 fee. There's a shortfall of funding for our universities here, which we have highlighted on many occasions. Um, these are issues and decisions for the, the executive to make in the future. At the moment, we are not looking at fee levels. But what I'm saying is that you know we really can't scrap a cap unless we do have additional funding. Um, and we have also pointed out that any additional places that we have is not a one-year uh, issue. It's a multi-year issue. Some people will be doing three-year courses. Some people will be doing five-year courses. So, uh, you know, the commitment needs to be that those courses are funded for the duration of, of the uh, cohort and indeed that the same situation might occur next year. So all of this, uh, it will be going into a paper to the executive this week. Thank you for that. I, I totally agree. I think what we have seen in the last couple of days is at least a commitment from the Minister, um, uh, Ms Dodds, in terms of her intention to, to try and assist in that, and also the Finance Minister, and hopefully that does be echoed across the executive, because this is something that definitely needs to happen. I mean, you raise, um, in terms of the numbers itself, how... Um, when, when will you get an idea from the from the universities that they, what they're asking for is a bit a flexible approach, basically that they don't know until next week what sort of numbers they're going to be needing. But what they are asking for is at least a flexible year from the department to say this is what we may need. Can you give us the opportunity to do that? I mean, is that something that the department is willing to do? Well, we, we've said that we're very willing to work with um, the sector. To see where we are overall and to see what we can do. You know, our main concern is the young people and making sure that young people are able to make the appropriate choices for themselves. And there are lots of choices out there. Yeah. Uh, so, as I say, over the next couple of weeks, we will have a much clearer picture. You know, I, I don't believe that even the universities themselves have the, the information about the grades yet through UCAS. And we, and we are liaising on a daily basis with counterparts uh, in England and with. UCAS to try and ensure that we get the, the information as soon as it is available. Yeah, just to finish, Chair, I totally agree with you there. I'm not one to preempt what they're going to say, but I imagine they will say exactly that, that they want the space to, until next week when they do have the clear idea about the numbers that they need. And then on the back of that, a commitment to see funding. And as you say, not just in year one, but the duration of those courses for the people who are coming on. And it can't be a commitment to look at it in year, monitor, in year monitoring rounds because those commitments, as we know in the past, aren't worth the paper they're written on because you can never guarantee that money will come. So um, I do hope, and, and myself and I know my party colleagues will be urging everyone within the executive to, to make that happen and hopefully create the space where we can see those extra university places created. But thank you. Um, Heather, can I just ask there, just um, in relation to John's point, there was discussions, I think, with the, the English Health Minister around medical places. Has there been any discussion or any indication yet that we may need additional uh, medical places? And is that something that has been discussed with the Health Minister? Um, I was speaking to Queen's recently, and they've been having those discussions with um, the Department of Health. Okay, thank you. Um, Gary. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Heather and Philip, for your uh, contributions. And Heather, I, I do welcome the comment that you made around 
looking at the totality of the picture, and I think that's very important. There has obviously been a fixation in the last uh, 24 hours, 48 hours around additional places, and you know, scrapping the Mazin cap, given an additional 1,000 places. When I speak to the universities, um, some of them more locally to my constituency, uh, there is concern because. Mm. Well, first of all, there's a concern that the spaces that we currently have, we're far from filling those spaces. Uh, if the um, additional places is provided um, without any thought really given and it's just, just handed over, then actually that will damage the regional piece, the regional mission that, that particularly the Ulster University have been on in trying to address uh, that imbalance uh, at Corey and, and McGee. So I, I, I do have concerns around that. I think there needs to be a particular focus in this moment in time to ensure that there's a regional balance in dealing with the places that we already have. You know, I, I listened to one of the Ulster University um, professors on the radio yesterday and, the, and, and they reined off a list of courses that's available at McGee, everything from law, mechanical, uh, manufacturing, engineering, computer science, a list of and a range of, of uh, courses. So there's spaces there um, increasing that um, the, the number of places at this minute in time will not help that situation actually. It'll be swallowed up by one particular institution uh, to the detriment of the other. So that, that, that's, that's one point that I wanted to make. The, the other point that I wanted to make was that again the other knock-on effect is with our further education colleges. Uh, I know there's concern there that uh, if additional places is given, that you know that will then hoover up, if you like, a lot of students that may have, may have weren't there. So I think that we need to look at all of this in the round, fill what we have, but also not take our eye off the fact that you know furlough was coming to an end, jobs have been lost left, right, and centre, businesses are shutting um, every day of the week. So we need to focus on ensuring we can get people into employment, whether that be through apprenticeship schemes or through other schemes uh, within our further education colleges. So it's just to hear your feedback on that and what conversations you're having with the universities at this moment in time. Uh, well, my feedback to you is that I agree entirely with, with everything that you have said. I did say earlier that we need to look at this in the round, uh, and there is no doubt there is displacement. Uh, I mean, I was looking at potential enrolments for um, HE and FE today, and those potentially could be significantly down. And um, you know, the skills barometer shows us that it's levels four and five where we have, have the, uh, the skills gaps. And you know, if we lose those places, then that situation isn't going to change. So that's why I'm saying yes, it does need to be looked at, looked at in the round. But we do need to keep the interests of young people in mind as well. And also to say that you know, there are other ways of gaining a degree through higher level apprenticeships. And all of that needs to be looked at, and it's not just the traditional go-to, um, you know, Queens or Ulster. But there are many other ways of achieving the same end result. Mm. Chair, just and thanks for that, Heather. And I do agree, and 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 um, the signs of it, you're very much looking at the bigger picture. Um, in the case where, and this is hypothetical, but in the case where additional places are being given. Um, will you know? Will there be any mitigations or conditions put in place to to ensure that in future years that we can actually reach that longer term regional balance goal? My, my my concern would be: look, if there's initial places given, they're going to be swallowed up in the, the main by by one institution. How do we ensure that we can then rectify because the, the, the regional balance going forward? Is, are, there, are there any conditions or mitigations that can be put in this year that can ensure that we can try and bring back a level of normality next year or the year after? Um, well, because it's very early days, we haven't really uh, we haven't looked into that part of it in detail. We are aware of the need for improving the, the regional balance across all of the various programmes that we have. Um, and you know, we'll be looking at that when we're working through the issues from, from this particular year. And also we are we will be coming back probably and not necessarily in this assembly mandate with the whole idea of sustainable funding for universities. You know, we are very limited in what we can do by the limits on our budget. Um, and it doesn't give us a lot of room for manoeuvre. Thank you. Thanks, um, Heather. And just to, to pick up on Gary's point as well, because it's a really important one about regional balance. 
um, and that slightly longer term picture that, that I already mentioned in terms of just even the next academic year but also subsequent years. Obviously there's the new decade, new approach um, commitment around expanding the number of places in McGee. How do we ensure that that is built into what we are doing this year um, and then planning for subsequent years? And have there been any discussions in relation to, to that and in particular with, with Ulster University? Uh, we, we have not had any further discussions on that. Um, you know, at the moment, we have been progressing the, the, with the University of Graduate Entry Medical School. You know, again, I have to go back to universities being autonomous, uh, and it would be for universities to come up with proposals, but it's very much linked to that sustainable funding model because we do not have additional funding to fund an expansion of 10,000 places at the moment. And that would be for the executive to decide to put that additional funding in or to look at a different mix of fees and teaching grant. But it just really, at the moment, at this point in time, I think I said that to the, the committee very early on, we do not have the funding for that expansion right now. Um, but we are willing to work with the university. We're willing to look at what ways we can achieve more of a balance even within what we've got. And, and we will um, seek to do that. Obviously, um, the university just appointed a new vice chancellor. We have an excellent relationship with the vice chancellor. He's very aware of these issues um, and we will work to see what we can do even within existing places. I mean, we set the cap on the institution as a whole, not on the campuses and not on individual courses. So there is some scope for manoeuvre. No, no, I, and I take that point, Heather, about the, the university having a role as well. But obviously there was the, the commitment in NDNA is that the executive will bring forward proposals around the expansion of places. So that is something I suppose that we do need to see a focus on. Um, Claire. Ah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Heather, and thank you, Philip. Um, I suppose I want to come back to the concern around filling the places in Northern Ireland universities. I am um, quite conscious that um, other jurisdictions within the United Kingdom have lifted their cap on places within universities, and I'm conscious that if we don't have the places at particular courses that students are applying for, it's all very well, I suppose, us as a committee and as a department um, having conversations about filling spaces, but if students don't want to go to those particular courses, then we're not going to force that. So where maybe we do have places in some subjects, maybe that's not what the students who have now lost their place want to go to. So are they going to look toward England and Wales and, and other jurisdictions potentially for um, different courses, maybe through the clearing process? And could we find ourselves in a situation where we're actually not able to fill spaces that students want to go to. I think whenever um, Boris Johnson made his announcement in relation to uh, the A-levels, I think it was an inevitable decision that our education minister then had to make the similar decision. And he almost put that, the whole crisis onto a UK footing. So I nearly feel that we have to look at it in a UK context as well, and whether that, advantage, that is an advantage to Northern Ireland or a disadvantage. And you know, I nearly feel that we're feeling a little bit vulnerable at this stage. And I do appreciate your comments in relation to the Barnet consequentials, but is there any opportunity or, or any attempt, whether our executive, and maybe it's the finance minister we need to be talking to in relation to this, has a conversation with Westminster and, you know, and talks about that additional funding that will be required to fund additional places here so that we don't undermine the Northern Ireland universities? Um, and a couple of other points, but it might be you know, useful to address that. Yeah. Uh well, we have, we have been in very frequent dialogue with our counterparts in uh, DFE in Westminster, um, and, and particularly we're focusing on you know, issues about financial sustainability of universities in the context of COVID and loss of research income and loss of international students. Now, fortunately, our universities are not as impacted by loss of international students, but the worry there was that a lot of universities over in England would have been and would have tried to fill their places by um, you know, aggressive marketing to Northern Ireland and Scottish and Welsh students. Mm -hmm. And that was why England introduced their student number caps. It wasn't a funding issue. It was to ensure that there would be good behaviour. Um, and really now they have lifted those caps. Their caps were never financial. As I say, their funding situation is totally different to ours. 
Um, you know, again, I, I have to go back to that. We really don't know the extent of this problem yet until we get the information. And then we can look at, at the whole sector in the round. And as you say, you know, it is not going to be to our advantage to, you know, fill an additional number of places at one university to the detriment of another local university and to the detriment of further education colleges. And, you know, it, it's very difficult and very complex. Every year, you know, there is that situation where people don't get into their first university choice um, and they have insurance offers. They have the opportunity to go into clearing and pick up the courses that, that they do want to do. Um, so I think it is what we need to ensure is that students have decent choices to be able to progress well in their lives. But I can't say right now how that's going to work um, for our local universities. Yeah, and I, I think that's the point I, I was trying to um, convey, that um, those caps existed to, to curb the bad behaviour so that they didn't become so competitive with other universities that maybe people were choosing to go to them instead of the universities in Northern Ireland. So what conversations is the minister and the executive as a whole having to ensure that Northern Ireland universities aren't undermined because they have a different policy to what we have here? And I think then to even further add to that, how do we support universities in, in respect of the, course, the, the places that they want to keep hold of but maybe are not able to fulfil in 2020 and are maybe considering trying to defer their students for a year? Now that, you know, I'm sure that, you know, that sounds quite extraordinary for students who were anticipating going off to university in September. But is there something that we could be doing in Northern Ireland, you know, perhaps you know, enabling them to go to an FE college almost as a bridge? to then going to university to try and keep them here in Northern Ireland, which is the most critical thing, if that's where they had hoped to go in the first instance. But is there a way to, to almost address the reality that this situation is bringing on? Because unless the executive comes up with more money to provide additional places to fulfil those original conditional office offers that those students anticipated they would get if they got the grades, and they now have because of the decision made by the Minister earlier this week, I think we need to address the reality in relation to this and we, we need to support them. We can't just let them hang for a year. I don't think that's fair. And you know there are opportunities, whether it is through employment, through in tra training, and we have FE colleges who are you know crying out saying, come here for a year. And maybe if they were to work with the universities in, in trying to bridge that gap so that these kids aren't you know left alone and isolated, maybe that's an opportunity they may want to take. And they may, you know, it, it may give them that space between school and further and higher education to actually you know decide what's absolutely right for them. Um, so I, I am concerned that the decisions taken, you know, we talk about this as a devolved issue, but it, it feels like it's become a UK wide issue, particularly when Scotland, you know, made their decision in relation to it. And then I think, as I said, when Boris Johnson made his, it was inevitable that Northern Ireland had to make theirs. But then the subsequent decisions and the consequences of that we're almost making them on a devolved basis. And I, I would like to see, certainly from our minister, more engagement with uh, Westminster to ensure that Northern Ireland isn't disadvantaged. It was absolutely right, the decision that the education ma minister made earlier in the week. It was the fairest and the most extraordinary of times. However, we need to now recognise that we support the decision he made in trying to fulfil what's right for our kids, you know, so um, I, I would, you know, it, it's for, it's, I, I appreciate this meeting um, and, you know, the, the chair for calling it because I do think it's these concerns that we have. Additional places are right, if it, it, the, the additional places in itself, how do we even work that out? Are we going to look at all the conditional offers that now cannot be fulfilled and are we, are we going to put the additional places in those? Um, uh, areas, you know, or, or is it going to be a, you know, which then could, as Gary and, and the chair had talked about, being an original imbalance, because if all the, the places that have been lost are in Belfast, then all of a sudden we have all of our um, higher education in one part of the area, and that's what we're trying to avoid too. But ultimately, it's about the students and their futures, and you know that's what you know a lot of MLAs fought hard for at the earlier of the week. So we now need to get to that next step, and I do think we've moved from the grades to actually using the grades, and um, I think it has to be on a UK footing. And I don't think we can let Westminster off with the decision they've taken, which I think has been then put on to everyone else. We, I think they need to put their money where their mouth is, to be quite honest, and I'm sure other colleagues would agree with me mm -hmm. in saying that. And you know, let's not get into this conversation about Barnet consequentials. Let's just um, uphold your responsibility in that respect. So I would be encouraging the minister to write off and see what we can do about getting that additional money you know, as, as a response to their decision, ultimately. So thank you, Chair. Okay. 
Um, just, I suppose, just to pick up on, on Claire's point, because it is, I suppose, a very complex um, scenario that we do face, because young people who have now fulfilled a conditional offer have an expectation of, of a place in, in that course. And I know that we, we can talk about um, you know, fill in places right across the board, but if they have an expectation of achieving that particular place, you know, how, you know is there an onus on the department to do what they can to, to facilitate that? Or how are we encouraging our institutions to collaborate with each other to ensure that there is that kind of spread across the board? Are those conversations happening? Um, to be perfectly honest, again, because we don't have the information and we don't know the extent of the problem that we're facing, we are having conversations, but they're not detailed conversations. You know, So yes, there, when I talk to Queen's and Ulster, they say that you know they would want to cooperate as far as possible. Uh, Queen's are looking at their legal position in terms of, of offers and if people have met the conditions, you know, do they absolutely have to have um, a, a place? Um, and you know, I do fear that, as, as we say, we don't necessarily need more places overall, but the places are just going to be skewed. And, and that, is, that is a concern, and I, I'm just being totally honest about that. So we, we do need to have the, the figures in front of us before we can map our way through this. Again, in terms of conversations with um, colleagues in, in Westminster, we have been very clear uh, from the very beginning of the, the pandemic about the impact that this potentially could have on our universities. But you know, at one point we were looking at, as I say, the fear was that m more of our young people would go away to England than, than would normally be the case because they would be lured by great offers. Um, you know, that, that does not seem to be happening. Um, and, uh, but we have no evidence for that either because we haven't got the figures from UCAS. Uh, and we will need to see what those are before we can make these decisions. But absolutely, in dialogue, trying to work our way through this in cooperation and collaboration. Thank you. Sinead? Okay, thank you very much, um, Heather and Philip. And, and just kind of go back on some of Philip's uh, figures that he mentioned earlier. He said that, you know, there was a 5% increase um, uh, on, on, on numbers of students for, for this year because of the anticipation of more students staying at home. And, uh, and that's going to go through for a few years. Um, can, he, can he break down exactly which institutions are getting those figures, those raised Mazen numbers? Yes. Um... In terms of the 5% uplift, uh, as I say, that, that'll be scaled over three years. So for for the, the current year, we would see a, an increase of, of 410, and that will be split 192 in Queens and 218 in Ulster. And it will be the same figure then year on year until we get to the end of three years. So at the end of three years, there'll be 1,232 additional places within those institutions so you would have obviously because of the nature of, of higher education provision you know by and large it's it's three years um so, so that's that's where that five percent uplift comes from and as i say that that would equate to, to the, for the um for the academic year that we're uh, entering into that's uh 2.2 million roughly um for the two institutions and whenever that gets up to uh, its full capacity, it will be an additional uh, seven million that's required. Okay, um, and and you put down a, you give a few more figures um, earlier on. I wonder, would you do me a favour and and could you put a little note in writing uh, to the clerk so that he can circulate those figures that you talked about earlier on, just to make sure that absolutely we've got that's, them, that's um, not a problem. Yeah. That we've got them right, uh, and and just back to Heather. I, I, I totally agree with with you, Heather. That this is a very difficult, um, difficult time, uh, and um, there's no clarity in the situation here at the moment. And there probably won't be for another couple of weeks until we see what way the the offers uh, land. But there certainly probably is going to be a skew towards more places being required for Queens. But my concern at the minute really is our overall. 
um, higher education and further education policy and our overall education policy, I suppose. And, and, and we as a committee wanted to do some work um, uh, in regarding the, the education and skills policy, particularly for the 14 to 19 year olds. Um, back, but then COVID has come, come in, in, uh, upon us and, and things like that. And it, the, the normal work of the committee has kind of gone on hold. But it's a constant, we can't be making strategy and policy under this constant changing um, situation here. We have to make sure that we uh, long term future proof our, uh, our economic policy and our skills policy. And, and we recently had a report out from the OC, OECD uh, skills report, and it provided a really excellent baseline analysis about the way forward. Um, and I think it's time for, for us as a committee, uh, and perhaps uh, to get um, a briefing from you, the officials, to give us uh, your clear proposals and how you're going to implement the recommendations um, that were contained in that OECD report, um, because uh, you know, I am really concerned that some of the decisions that will be made in the next few weeks are made on the hop, and they're going to have long-term implications for um, our institutions. Uh, and I'm particularly thinking of about the displacement of, of, of places. And if we have places here in Northern Ireland, you know, um, in, in our higher education institutions, be it Ulster University or Queen's, that are not being taken up by our students, and they're preferring to go um, to Scotland, to Wales, to England, to do the exact same course that we're funding here in Northern Ireland. And yet we're giving student loans for people to go somewhere else to do the same course, then are we not spending good money after bad? And are we not doing damage to our own economy? I think that we, uh, uh, as uh, the executive and as the assembly, must make Northern Ireland education institutions more um, acceptable and more attractive to our students. The thing that we want to do, and I, and I keep on talking, I want the mass and calf lifted because I want far more students staying here each year and coming back and staying in this uh, in this area to provide uh, and help support our economy and the way that we are actually our policy our strategy the whole functionality of our higher education system is against that we're we're, we're tying a noose on our own development of our own economy and it's you know it hasn't helped us in the past it isn't helping us now and if we keep on going down this route our, our future will be the same as our present which isn't really very good. Okay, I'll answer that in two parts. So first of all, in relation to the OECD report, um, you know, we're very happy with that report. Um, we will probably do a response to it. Uh, OECD obviously were committed by ourselves to do that piece of work and we've worked, worked very, very closely with them. Um, we are now using that report and a couple of other pieces of research that we have in order to develop the skills strategy for Northern Ireland. Um, previous skills strategy concentrated very much on qualifications for people um, really entering into education for the first time and getting those qualifications. I think the focus of the next skills strategy will look more at upskilling and reskilling and digital skills and the skills that we need for our economy. So we're very excited to be taking forward that piece of work. And yes, of course, we'll come and brief the, the committee on that. In terms of um, you know, places for education here versus people going away, that's a more difficult one. That's quite tricky because quite often people go away, not necessarily because the course is not offered by our local institutions, but they want to have a different life experience. They want to go away and be a bit more independent and, and learn how to budget, et cetera. So there are very many reasons why people choose to go away. I think the secret for ourselves and our economy is to get those people back after they have completed their studies elsewhere. So that, that is not simply a function of, of our education system or what is or is not available here. Those, those I think they are complicated things. You know, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. The issue about the cap, the cap can only be scrapped or lifted if higher education is put on a sustainable funding basis 
Uh, and to date, when there have been budget cuts, unfortunately, it has fallen on higher education, probably disproportionately in our department, um, because that's one of our biggest budgets. And if you have a substantial budget cut, um, then sometimes that's that's where it lands. Um, you know, but we we are in in the skills and education group. We're very passionate about ensuring that we have the best quality offering for skills and education right throughout all the levels and for every citizen. Thank, thank you, Heather, for that. And I suppose you can hear my frustration as well. It's just that we keep going around in the same circle that is not uh, that it, it is not feeding in and developing the economy the, the way the way we should. And I agree that the priority for for any economy is investment in skills. And it's very short sighted that the first cut um, goes to to areas where we are actually, you know depending on to get out of uh, any economic difficulties. And we're heading into a very, very dark economic future at the moment. Uh, and that will raise its head probably. We'll see it uh, in particular maybe coming from <coughs> October onwards. And, and we really, that's the time to actually throw everything that we have on higher education and further education. And I'm, I don't want to fixate on, on, on universities either. There's other pathways to success. Uh, and I myself, I, I, when I left school, I went to the Northwest Regional College. I didn't go to university, um, and I left there and went straight into work uh, and worked my way up, and then went to university later on, um, uh, later on in life. And that is a pathway uh, uh, that many of our young people should take, and it's not a pathway of failure. It's, it's just a different pathway for success, and we need to be able to support our further education uh, institutions. And I, I, I'm afraid some of the displacement that we are going to see um, is within the, within the further education um, sector, uh, uh, and that would be a real regret uh, for me and, and for many of our young people um, in Northern Ireland. But there's a lot of work to be done, and I don't want to be reactive at this particular point in time. We have had a, a fiasco uh, with our A-levels. We have dealt with it, but this is an another hurdle that we can't just uh, react very quickly. We have to think it all out. I agree entirely. John? Heather, uh, thank you for your uh, update thus far, though as limited as it's been. Can I bring you to, and that's no fault of yours, can I bring you to the start of your presentation? Uh, I think you said that you have received no papers yet from uh, either of the two universities, but you're in conversations with them. Am I correct on the first point, and what does conversations mean? Um, well, the, the chief operating officers of the universities lift the phone to me and we have a conversation, um, but I mean, nobody really is in a position to produce a paper when we don't have the information. But I have just been informed that CIA certainly will have the, the revised grades with UCAS tomorrow, you know. So in the next number of days, we should have a lot more detail about what is actually happening. Well, I have to say, I'm, I'm disappointed, surprised, and slightly shocked that the committee hasn't been receiving today a progress report mm. on how the department is going to help solve this problem. Because while universities are autonomous, never before, well, not since the 1970s, have we had a more interventionist role by government, both at local and uh, at Westminster level? Uh, and I'm not going to say I'm going to argue against that. But uh, what we need in this occasion is an intervention from the department, particularly led by the minister. Uh, at this stage, in my view, uh, the department should have had the two universities in a room engaging with them as to how we progress this matter and how we solve an issue. Because what, what I see yesterday it reminded me of a certain stages of the peace process where we had megaphone diplomacy, where one side sent out a spokesperson and, the hope that, and spoke to the media in the hope that the other side would pick it up and they'd respond in due course. What we had yesterday was megaphone diplomacy and budget negotiation, where one university was going out and saying, we need 1,000 and more numbers. Another university was going out and saying, well, we've got empty spaces we can do. What really should be happening is, the department should have those two universities in a room and leading from the front on it and saying, we need to have a problem. How do we solve it? And that may, I'm not saying it could have been solved yesterday or the day before, but I don't see any plan to solve it other than waiting on to we'll get the numbers at some stage. 
I'm sorry, I have no answer for that. This is not something that we normally would be involved in, as I said. So we don't get the information directly. And when we do get the information, we will be able to have those sorts of conversations. But at the moment, nobody really has this, this detail. There, there are, there's at least one university which will be seeking additional funds. There was talk in the, news, in the media yesterday about the £10 million per annum for the next three to four years. Uh, if those universities are coming looking more money, then I think that there's a duty on the department to shape how that money is spent. Uh, and to do and, that, and, and it, we will, we will do. We will, we will talk with the universities. As I said at the, the outset of this, I, I we need to look at this in the round across the whole sector, not just the two universities. Yes, I appreciate that, and that's, well, that's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not sure it's a case of talk to the universities. I think it's a case of where we need a, a government department and a minister telling the universities. I think we're that, that's the stage we're at in other sectors and other factors of our public administration. And we are in completely unusual circumstances. And I'm sorry for, for protracting these at you, Heather, because the minister's not here. And, I'm, I'm not, and I don't like uh, pointing, pointed questions at, at officials because officials take political direction. Uh, and I pref much prefer the minister was sitting in front of me and, and I could let her know my views on this matter. But it's clear, in my opinion, that this matter needs departmental leadership. We'll take that on board and we'll have conversations with the Minister as well. Okay, just, just one other point, Heather, in, in relation to teacher places. Uh, I noted your comment at the start that uh, the Minister of Education sets teacher training numbers and the department pays for them. Well, technically that's true. My, my, my experience of that was that it was a negotiation in relation to the numbers and the expenditure. That may not be written down in any of the, the, the guidance or financial guidance or ministerial guidance, whatever it may be, but I can assure you when I was dealing with uh, colleagues around the executive table, there was a negotiation around it. Uh, I see no, you shaking there, your head there is, no. there is no negotiation. Uh, there is a model run and we are told what the numbers are and the breakdown of those numbers across the institutions that are providing teacher training. Um, Chair, could I really apologise, but I have 80 people waiting for me on a Zoom meeting that I am the chair of, so I'm going to have to go, but I can leave you in the capable hands of Philip and Jim. Okay, okay thank you, Heather, and thanks for being with us at short notice as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. You know, yeah, Jim is there. Okay. One more. I can see him. John, have you... Um, the, the, the issue of regional balance has been uh, raised again, and this is one of the points I'm making around uh, telling the universities and, and engaging at, at that, with that uh, method. Um, I am concerned that we could act in haste here and regret at leisure, particularly in regards to tackling regional imbalance and the historical regional imbalance. Um, so. I'm not expecting an answer to this, but it's certainly something I would hope officials will take on board and bring back to their minister, that uh, there needs to be uh, an, uh, an advancement on the progress at, at McGee and campuses such as that, rather than a retraction from that. Because if we make decisions now around increasing numbers of students, we're having an impact on next year's applicants, because mm -hmm. uh, we could, we're most likely running into a very, very finan difficult financial situation. And whatever expenditure we make this year will have an impact on next year's expenditure and student numbers as well. So it's, it's something to be keep minded. Thanks, John. Um, John Stewart, you were looking back in. Gordon, oh, Gordon. sorry, Gordon. Sorry, Gordon. Thanks, Chair. And uh, yeah, there have been some fine speeches this afternoon. I, wasn't, I didn't have one prepared. But the, um, <laughs> what I would say, I welcome the, the statement from our minister yesterday. The minister is committed to supporting our young people. She is on leave. Uh, this week, but I believe will be at the executive tomorrow. So there is a strong commitment there for her to work with other ministers, including the finance minister, to see a way through to help our young people at this most difficult time as a result of COVID and all the implications of it. So I think that's important we, we underline and reinforce that. Enough has been said. I think the important thing is that there is a balance in, in all of this uh, across the universities, across Northern Ireland. And the points have been well made about our FE colleges. A lot of money has been invested in them over recent years. The minister has shown strong commitment towards that, and the point has been made by Heather about uh, promoting the, the whole thing of apprenticeships, upskilling, 
retraining, which is going to be a major issue now, as, as points have been well made about the job losses that are unfortunately coming down the line. So I think it's important that, that there is a balance across all of those uh, different uh, sectors, and uh, I'm supportive of most of what has been said in the long speeches that I've had to listen to. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Gordon, dear, you were looking back. Thanks, Chair. Gordon, you may not have one prepared, but it was a good speech. <laughs> <laughs> never let us down. George, focus on all that. Sure, um, Phil, just to, to touch on a few things. I think. Just to sum up here, we are shooting in the dark quite a bit, and while I agree with most of what's been said, until we have those final results, we won't really know. But what I am interested in, you were talking about um, some, air, some of the education providers being undersubscribed in terms of the capacity and whatnot. We won't actually know. I mean, where are you getting those figures from? Given that we're going to see a massive increase potentially and, and everyone's grades going up by 30 or 40 percent compared to what they got last week, Will that not have a knock-on effect to every institution and the potential for places everywhere to potentially go up? Or I'm just curious, when you say those figures in terms of the subscription levels at this stage, what, is that based on what happened last week or what you're anticipating to happen when these results come out? Uh, thanks for the question. I, I think the, the figures that we I was talking about earlier, that was the initial 5% uplift that we had sought in the June monitoring round, which we had brought about as a result to COVID and the sort of expectation that greater numbers would have wanted to stay within Northern Ireland. So it's not specifically related to the, the A level issue. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Jim, can I just ask a, a question in relation to the BTEX? Um, or I'm not sure either Jim or Philip, just in, if you can give a wee update in relation to um, what the situation is in relation to that. Jim, Jim, your sound is off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is he still there? He, no, he, we can see him, but you can't see him on the main screen. You can see him on this screen. <laughs> Jim, 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 we can't hear you. He's putting on earphones. Just Jim's just putting on some earphones. Mm -hmm. Jim, we still can't hear you. Check check on your, your toolbar that you, you don't have sound muted. No. Yeah. Usually when it's muted, it comes up, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's not coming up muted. Um, I'm not quite sure what has happened there, Chair. Um, it should show up on the screen if it's muted. It's not showing up as muted, so there may be a technical issue that we may need to come back to that. Okay. We need to come back to that. Um, Claire, do you want to? It was actually the same question. Oh, right. right. Okay. okay. Um, we we may we may need to come back to that one, Chair, because I, I don't think Jim can hear us. Um, we can't hear him. He can hear, oh, he can hear us, but we can't hear him. I'm not really sure what has happened there. Apologies for that. I also have a question in relation to the apprenticeship. apprenticeship. Um, I'm not sure if Philip's able to pick up on any of those. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid B, B tax and apprenticeship is very much Jim's daily work. <laughs> that's the useful thing, but I'm saying. Um, what we could potentially do is gather questions and send them to Jim, because okay. I, I don't think we're going to be able to rectify the, the sound issue at our end. Yeah, um, and maybe come back to it next week with yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, um, Philip, I think that's us for, for now then as well. Thank you to yourself and Jim for being with us and um, I'm sure we'll, we'll be getting further briefings from you. Thank you. Okay, then we're moving on to um, our next um, briefing which is from Queen's and Ulster Universities. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 9. There's also a response from Stranmillis University College at page 7 of your pack and a response from St Mary's University College at page 8. There's a note from um, FE College Principals then at page 10. Um, and there's a further document that you have been circulated from yes, we've, Ulster. We've got the, the update from Ulster that arrived in during the meeting. Members now have a hard copy. Um, 
Okay, so obviously members are, are well aware at this point that universities are still uh, waiting on clarification on how the um, rising student and A-level students meeting the grades will impact at, at the local universities and how it will be handled by the department and resourcing and all of that. So we're just going to get a briefing from um, the officials that we have with us. Um, it's Mrs Jo Clegg, who's the Registrar and Chief Operating Officer of Queen's and Professor Paul Bartholomew, who is Vice Chancellor at University of, or Ulster University, and I'd just like to extend congratulations to Paul on his appointment um, yesterday um, as Vice Chancellor. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Rosh. So, I, I hand over to yourselves um, to make it maybe an opening statement, and then we will pick up with some questions, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, since I have the mic, I'm going to just um, go, go first. Uh, I, I'd, I'd just like to um, commend the committee on the quality of the uh, questions and, and, and debate so far. For, for my money, I think that you are absolutely on, on point in, in what the key issues are. And I'm, I'm confident that I've been both institutions when I say that we're really committed to wanting to find a collaborative solution that, that works for, for everybody. And thus, I think the committee today uh, is, is a really good, good step in that. And to reiterate what uh, Heather Cousins was saying is that there's been a lot of dialogue um, so far, but but, but not um, to ignore what some members of the committee have, have pointed out to that, you know, talk needs to translate into action. I think there are things that we um, can do collectively, but there are also some um, ramifications for the situation that we find ourselves in. Where I think I've been um, ta taken most security is from the, the notion that we probably have to, to sit down and, and, and think about it and, and, and think through it and not react ever so quickly, just in what is really still hours since uh, the, the, the decision to upgrade uh, those results. The, the, the full extent of those results will only become apparent to, to universities in the next coming days when SEER um, passes those, that date or those data to um, UCAS and then the results will cascade through into our systems. We will run those again to see where the degree of uh, mismatch occurs and then it's incumbent on us to um, manage that, that, that situation. In terms of um, proximity to limits on particular courses, I think at Ulster we have a much less acute uh, problem than um, Queen's will have, and, and uh, Joe will talk to that in, in due course. From our perspective, I, I, I think in terms of the Belfast uh, proposition, there's uh, a very good sense that our Belfast proposition will, will fill too, and indeed may be subject to uh, some, some need of over-recruiting on that. But we are committed through our own regional mission to uh, be able to, to supply places across the region. We think that's uh, um, absolutely central to our, to our mission, and it's really important for Northern Ireland that we're able uh, to do that. So my key consideration and concern going forward is that we don't inadvertently, by trying to respond to acute needs, interrupt the delicate system and balance that we have to populate um, our regional provision, both across HE and indeed HE and FE, um, to ensure that, that we can have viable provision across institutions and in particular regions. Members will know that there is a geographical distribution in relation to widening participation. And for Ulster University, the proposition in the, the Northwest is particularly important to that. And we also, I think, have a responsibility to our Coleraine uh, campus uh, as well as another um, re sub-regional campus. So as I say, I think filling the Belfast proposition is always something that's going to be relatively um, straightforward. We've known that for some years. But trying to juggle our multiple campuses um, is, is difficult for us. And just having a money following the student perspective disincentivizes uh, an institution from being able to uh, supply those places. We do the, 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 um, a good job, I think, in trying to do that. And although we have many places available, it will interest the committee to know that uh, we're not actually uh, down at all on where we would have been this time last year. It's fairly uh, flat for us. We're perhaps slightly uh, ahead. The difference is, is that there are more students to place since the uh, additional numbers have, have gone on, and it's that number that we would fall uh, short of in, in our um, regions in the north and, and, and northwest. Um, but our Belfast proposition will be secure in, in, in terms of uh, numbers, and our Jordanstown proposition will be um, probably uh, end up somewhere uh, between the two. 
I, I'm really attracted to some of the comments that have been made this afternoon in relation to considering the system uh, as, a, as a whole and the investment that's made by the, the, the people of uh, Northern Ireland through the, the, the departments to provide places across the region. And I think I'm strongly of the, the, the view that, that that investment needs to be made um, to work. And only after we're confident that we have the efficiencies and best fit within the system should we uh, consider what we can do uh, on, on top of that. We'll have a clearer picture in the next couple of uh, days, but then we already know from the data that we hold that there will be a large degree of asymmetry between where students wish to go and perhaps it would even feel that they uh, have have a right to go and where the places um, actually the vacancies um, remain. So I think that would do for, as an uh, as interim uh, statement for, from me and happy to take questions in due course. Thank you, Paul. Um, Joel, I hand over to you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak with you today. I've been listening in, so I know, I know colleagues on the committee don't want long speeches. Uh, but that said, I do want to be able to provide you with as much clarity as I can around the position of Queen's and also provide you with some information on the areas that we too are seeking clarity and the committee can perhaps support us in. So as Paul has said, um, for us, so the same goes for Queen's, that we are absolutely committed to showing as much flexibility as possible to maximise the number of applicants who are able to access uh, higher education in what's been a very challenging year. And as part of this student-centred approach, the university did in fact confirm offers to 2,700 applicants in July this year in order to um, reduce anxiety and provide some certainty to young people and their families. These were offers that wouldn't normally have been confirmed until mid-August. And this intervention was widely welcomed by school principals and young people. And indeed, we believe, referring to the discussions earlier on in the committee about the loss of young people to elsewhere in the UK, we do believe that more of our young people would have been considering accepting places elsewhere in England had we not made that move. Um, as a result of COVID-19 and at our own risk as an institution, we have already significantly increased the capacity in many of our subjects to allow more students to be able to benefit from continuing their education at Queen's. So just to put some context on that and for information for you, um, linking into the numbers that you were getting there from Philip earlier on from the department. Um, all of these numbers I quote, by the way, are in relation to um, Northern Ireland and EU undergraduates, which is the, the focus at the moment around these A-level results. So last year in 1920, we had an intake of just over 3,300 students. This year, already as of today, without making any allowance for the students who might now meet the terms of the offer because of the policy decision uh, around the centre assessed grades, we have uh, confirmed, fir firmly confirmed over 4,300 students. So that's already an additional thousand students over and above this point last year, um, which is why we're saying in some of the coverage you will have seen this week that we won't be able to um, meet the demand from students that might be coming through from centre assessed grades and any uplifting grades as a result of that um, without additional funded places. Um, I take on board that there was the additional 5%, but as has been mentioned for Queen's, that was 192 places. Um, and we are already, as of today, um, firmly accepting a thousand more than this time last year. Um, the numbers you will have heard, um, perhaps reported in the press this week, of the um, additional 500 to 1,000 students. J just to be clear, we, we currently do not have access, as uh, Heather has said earlier for the department, to the centre assessed grades. So we are awaiting information from UCAS um, and the exam boards on that. And we understand that we should be in receipt of those uh, information either tomorrow or Friday um, via UCAS. So we currently don't have access to that. The information that we've provided is the number of applicants for whom we have um, rejected who didn't meet the terms of the offer that Queen's gave them on the basis of the calculated grades that were released on the 13th of August. 
So that was around uh, about uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 students who we rejected because they didn't meet the calculated grades. Until we have greater clarity uh, on which students have now met the conditions of their offer based on those centre assessed grades, we're not able to confirm precisely how many um, additional places we may be able to offer for entry in this current year um, and whether due to capacity restrictions and funding restrictions, if more funded places are not made available, whether it may be subsequently necessary to offer guaranteed deferred entry um, for some students for 2021. That would absolutely not be our preference, but that may be the position we find ourselves in. It's very important that we highlight that there are areas where we have very little flexibility. So as has already been mentioned by colleagues on the committee, we do have um, a number of quota controlled courses such as medicine, dentistry, nursing, social work um, in areas where there are external caps applied um, largely through the Department of Health. And it is not yet clear if the quota for these courses will be adjusted. As the department has said, we have been in dialogue with the Department of Health um, to see whether there is any scope for raising the quota on those programmes. Um, but there will, be, there will be clear limits to how many students um, we can offer capacity for in terms of clinical placements and in terms of our own internal capacity within the university. We are very clear that where those quotas are lifted for students in England, we will be pushing for um, a, a similar uplift for, for the students and the young people from Northern Ireland. In addition, there are a number of high demand subject areas where we've got um, genuine capacity restrictions. And that's not just in terms of funded places, although um, funding clearly will be necessary. Um, it's also in terms of teaching space, teaching staff and accommodation that we need to take into account. Um, and that's, that's really important to protect the educational integrity of, of the offer to all of our students. And these issues, as you will appreciate, are particularly complex this year due to the need to preserve social distancing and keep all of our staff and students safe on campus. So as has been discussed already at the committee, this current situation really highlights the need um, for the design and implementation of a new sustainable funding model for higher education in Northern Ireland that will enable our universities to meet the demand from local students and importantly play a key, key role in the economic recovery, particularly um, post-COVID. Uh, as has been mentioned, we are very supportive of colleagues in the department and across the sector that we would like to see a more holistic system-wide approach across both HE and FE to how we plan the availability of education to our young people. However, that approach, that systems-wide holistic approach must be planned um, and we need to build that into our institutional strategies and particularly into our offer making strategies, which happen much earlier in the cycle um, than this stage of the cycle, which we're currently at. So um, that I suppose is, is the more, um, the longer term position, but it is an opportunity now for us collectively to look to address that. But for the immediate people now, um, we urgently seek some clarity. Um, Queen's has entered into a contract with students um, on the basis of the information that was available to us at the time. And they are contracts that, um, based on those numbers I've provided to you, without additional funded places, um, we may be unable to deliver on, and that's due to matters outside of our control and to this um, late, completely understandable, but late policy um, adjustment, which had been made after we had already confirmed our places um, through confirmation and, and through those first few days of clearing as well, which are always our busiest. So now what we, we really seek um, is urgent clarity um, from, from UCAS, which we believe will be forthcoming this week, on how many students will now have met the terms of our offer, and from the executive on how many additional places will be resourced. Um, not just for this year, but for the duration of those programmes at Queen's that those students are looking to study. There are also knock-ons, um, and this is the same across the sector in the UK, um, and we would be looking for further commitments around students who may, may need additional support academically, 
around access um, for students to tuition fee loans, to maintenance support and hardship funds. We will need some support around student accommodation, which for Queen's is already full. Um, and additional support around equipment that might be needed for, for specialist and practical elements of programmes, particularly in the light of the need to be delivering to smaller groups for teaching in the light of the COVID restraints. Um, we do understand that um, our counterparts in, in England and the rest of the UK are seeking um, and bidding for additional teaching grant in addition to the additional fees that they may um, that they may um, be awarded from students who they recruit to their universities. They are looking for specifically additional government teaching grant support in these areas. And for Queen's particularly, notwithstanding those discussions about the needing to take a sector-wide approach for the longer term, we are seeking as an absolute minimum to protect the unit of resource per student at the same levels as 1920. And as this committee is well cited on, uh, even at those 1920 levels, that's significantly below our comparative to universities to the tune of about £1,500 per student. So that is what we would be seeking commitment for as a minimum. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Um, thank you to you both for, for the presentations. They, they're really um, informative. Obviously, we, we do understand that we are, to some extent, still working in the dark in terms of the numbers, um, but it is still useful to get that, that background picture. Um, I think we would be very keen to encourage a very collaborative approach to this, as, as you've already heard from, from the previous discussion with the officials. Um, and anything that can be done between yourselves as institutions, but other institutions across the, the North as well, in terms of the colleges, the, the teaching colleges and the regional colleges, um, would be really, really um, welcome. Um, we do, of course, understand that the, the, the situation that, that you are in in relation to having made offers and um, the expectation that there is in relation to fulfilling those offers. Um, and I guess that is something that we will have to you know, see how that plays itself out over the next little while as well. Um, I guess it would just be interesting to, to maybe get um, a, a feel for what, what have you heard perhaps from um, a legal perspective around that, that contract that there is between a university and, and a student on the basis of a conditional offer? Yeah, so in terms of the legal advice we've had from Queen's um, and the, the sector as a whole, I should say, um, are seeking some generic legal advice to higher education institutions, but we do need to recognise that each uh, institution will have their own individual contracts and whilst there'll be a lot of similarities, they they may indeed be, be, be bespoke because we are autonomous institutions. Um, for Queen's, the advice we've had is that um, we, we indeed have entered into contracts with those students. Our own individual contracts do um, contain um, a, a force New York withdrawal clause, which means that um, there are exceptions to be made when there are circumstances that are outside of our control, which clearly is the place here. Um, and that, that therefore might be reasonable on that basis um, to offer guaranteed entry for next year where we can't accommodate that this year. Now, um, whilst that is the legal advice, clearly that is not our preferred position and that's not in the best interest of the young people in Northern Ireland. And it's hard to see how, that, um, how we can deliver that in an equitable basis from those students who we have already confirmed places for who had um, offers based on the grades last week versus students who now might meet the terms of the offer based on uh, new grades that we will be receiving later this week. But that's where we stand on the, on the legal position currently. And if I can just add something to that from um, colleagues uh, in terms of having a, a, a conversation with, with Universities UK, there is a sense, as, 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 as Joe said, that it's not quite cut and dry, and this is all, we're all about what's fair and reasonable. And the COVID context certainly impacts onto that. And uh, there is a strong sense that if um, provision is expanded, i.e. courses get bigger than has been planned for under health and safety legislation, that that health and safety legislation is likely to, to play quite large within the legal argument around what's, what's fair and reasonable. Uh, and, and I think that's probably to be expected. Um, yeah, that, that was leading on to my, my next point, I suppose, is around 
um, the circumstances that we do find ourselves in in relation to COVID um, and how all of this is impacting on, on the plan for reopening as an institution um, anyway and the, the types of constraints that potentially you can find yourselves under in relation to additional numbers but also just given the, the, the current trajectory that we are seeing in relation to um, cases of COVID, how that is all being factored into to the planning at the current time. I, I'd quite like to say that to begin with. I, I think from, from, from our perspective, we, we've, we've, we've gone through our entire portfolio programme by programme. We've looked at every uh, uh, module and we ca categorise those in terms of uh, category one and, and category two. In the category one modules, there were those where we feel that the learning outcomes of, of, of the module can really only be achieved with some campus-based um, provision. Accordingly, we're using our, our campuses to prioritise um, those uh, modules, uh, normally teaching the sessions within them multiple times with, with, with students and using our estate in that way, under the understanding that the other modules, that perhaps it would be nice to have campus-based um, provision, but could be taught online, um, we, we, they, they, they're timetabled with, with second, second priority. That gives us some flexibility and indeed um, when we closed the campuses on March the 18th we were faced with a, a similar situation where we had to move provision online. We know that we can move provision online indeed when you do move provision online it, the pedagogies i.e. the teaching techniques to teach those students become quite, quite scalable. Um, for, for us, uh, we've got reasonably uh, generous is, is state and, and accordingly we can be quite quite flexible with some of that scalability, but there are of course some uh, hard stops in relation to that where you've got particular um, pieces of uh, lab equipment um, and it, it gives a, a hard a number against how many you can put through per, per hour in terms of some simulated practice and so forth. So it certainly isn't a one size uh, fits all. In terms of numbers that we might need to grow on particular programs. I don't think I'm yet looking at anything that would be unmanageable for us within a COVID context while keeping our students uh, safe. It may have some knock-on impacts for, as I say, those Category 2 modules, which would be the nice to have more of our time maybe spent doing those Category 1 modules, but I think we have the capacity uh, to do that and the, fle and, and the flexibility to, to, to do so. And if we get to the point whereby everything gets shut down again, well, the, the universities have want to be there, but we have certainly re rehearsed that e earlier in, in, in the year, uh, and we will have to defer some learning to later in the year and, and, and do that and, and, and reorganise. But it's not without its pragmatic difficulties. Uh, I, I think we're over them, we've considered them, we have a good, safe way through, and it's scalable to, to a degree. Yeah, I, and I would, I would echo um, all of what Paul has said there. I think um, there is a very difficult balance for institutions here in managing the impact on the workforce and maintaining the integrity of the educational experience for the student as well. So whilst we are equipped to deliver um, a, a lot of this material in a digitally enhanced way, um, you know, the, the pedagogical developments around that, it, it is not simply a case of picking up a lecture that you would have delivered face to face and recording it once and then it, that's available online. Um, it, the, the, the whole pedagogy for um, digital online learning is very different to how we would deliver face to face. So we have been planning in, in a very similar way to uh, as Paul's articulated. There are a number of, um, a, 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 number, a small number of subject areas at Queen's where because of the restrictions I've referred to around teaching space, uh, teaching staff and accommodation, we really do feel we're all at absolute capacity. Um, and that's not particularly uh, in terms of financial constraints. That's, you know, irrespective of additional funding, we may not be able to deliver more capacity in some of those subject areas. Um, and some of that planning we will need to revisit um, in the light of potentially additional uh, student numbers and additional larger class sizes. But we really need to see the numbers first to see which subject areas um, any uplifting grade is, is having the most impact on. Okay, thank you. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentations. Um, 
In July, Queensland University of Ulster op offered guaranteed places to about 2,500 Northern Ireland students uh, before they got their A-level results. When the, uh, the adjusted grades came out, not the, not the most recent results, but the, 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 not the predicted ones, but the adjusted ones came out, was there any significant um, vacancies as a result of that to the 2,500 places? I know I've been aware of a few that I've heard of, but was there any significant numbers there that, that are occurred because of that? I think if I can answer from a, from a Queen's perspective, um, we have a, a huge amount of expertise and, and intelligence in terms of our offer making strategies and the amount of information that is available to us on um, students' prior performance uh, up to the point of taking their A-levels and then from previous years looking at the trend data as how that prior tra performance translates to their final A-level results or their BTEC results or um, whichever qualification that they've chosen to go down. Um, and I think the, the places that we confirmed early, what we saw when the, um, the A-level uh, results, the initial results came out last Thursday, was there was a huge amount of correlation there. The one number that, that um, does stand out for us and which we are pleased with um, is that through looking at that additional contextual information, we were able to confirm a, a wider number of widely in participation cohort students into Queen's than might have been the, the case in previous years. So we actually uh, are seeing a benefit to our widely in participation cohorts through the approach that we took there. Okay. Uh, and if I just respond on, on behalf of Ulster, there wasn't really significant difference between um, those numbers that we, we predicted with the, the, the data we had using very similar uh, algorithms and, and indeed the same methodologies with, with, with Queen's in relation to doing that. And we did so in the knowledge that, that where there would inevitably be small numbers of non-overlap, we would have the capacity to take those uh, students do and always knew that we would have a, uh, have a uh, commitment to to do so. And indeed, as we as we move forwards, uh, I, I think, as, as you heard before, we, we still have some uh, capacity to be able to take the new grades um, to. But certainly, I think the predictive power of the data analysis that we did before was quite accurate as it was based on the historical data. But of course, we know that this year, with the uplifted grades that have just related um, just cascaded from student um, teacher projections, that's actually out with the normal pattern of distribution of marks that we would have seen and would be completely outside of the, the data set that we modelled on, but certainly our, our data would have closely uh, modelled the, the outcome of the initial the initial results, um, because that's how the, those, those results were achieved. They were achieved by, by looking at a similar data set and balancing it against uh, pre, pre, previous years. Okay. For Queen's University, what would be the implications uh, if you had to bring in 600 students? What would be the implications for accommodation, for example, staff and other resources, if you were encouraged to take 600, 700 students? What would be the, the implications? Obviously, cost is significant. But what would, and have you any idea what the cost would be if you had to take on six or 700 students? In terms of the implications, um, clearly it, it will present us with a major challenge and we're absolutely committed, as, as I've said, to showing as much flexibility and as agility as we can to deliver on that challenge. It's very difficult to get into the specifics around the implications uh, in terms of staffing, accommodation, etc. until we see the numbers because so much of it will depend on the subject mix um, and where the extra demand is coming through. Um, so I think before I can really give you um, uh, a very helpful answer to that question, we really do need to see the numbers for the centre assessed rates. What about the University of Ulster? I understand they have quite a bit of capacity. Would you be in a position to take hundreds of students if you, you were encouraged to do so? Yes, we would. We, we still have, have, have capacity uh, both within our, our estate and our um, modelled Model numbers. We've already uh, looked at our um, campus carrying capacity, and um, certainly in terms of if we add up the numbers of where we are now, 
the numbers of those students, which I believe were 273 that we um, rejected on, on, on the basis of, of the early grades, if all of those translated to me, if we add those up, and if we got significant uh, other students, we, we still have headroom to accommodate uh, all, all, all students. Okay, thanks for your answers. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Fair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose, Paul, congratulations, and I look forward to uh, meeting you, uh, I suppose, more from a, a constituency perspective, and, and it's always good to hear you put on record your commitment to Coleraine, and indeed the Minister did that herself. Um, but I do very much sympathise with the comments you made, and indeed your predecessor would have made similar comments in relation to the multi-campus. Uh, arrangement of Ulster University and the, the, the necessity to, to have to fund that because you know other you know it is a very unique situation that does come with additional costs and sometimes we, we, we're almost uh, reluctant to, to recognize that um, you know and, and if you want to uphold your commitment and indeed if the minister wants to uphold hers I think we have to be uh, realistic about the costs in being able to do that whether it's Corey McGee you know, Belfast, you know, anywhere. So, um, you know, I, I think it's important that, that we put that on record, you know, first and foremost. Um, I suppose it's just to pick up on a point that I had asked department officials earlier in relation to uh, the vulnerability of Northern Ireland now that the cap has been lifted in England and Wales. And this would be particularly a question um, to Ulster University. You know, from, from the comments that you have made thus far, you are suggesting that you do have places left. I'm not sure how considerable a number of places that is. Would you uh, feel vulnerable that now that there are opportunities for students to perhaps study in, in universities where maybe where they didn't think that was an opportunity before they're going to seek that through clearing and then that might make some of the places that you have offered up vulnerable? And what does that mean for the long-term impact of Ulster generally? Are, are we getting a sense that you're not filling your places? And bums on seats does essentially mean funding. So, you know, what does the department, what do we um, as an assembly, as an executive, of, you know, how, how can we be cognizant of that happening generally, and what does that mean, particularly this year, because of what has recently happened in England in relation to the number of places? Thank you. The number of points there, and I'll try and remember them and take, take, take them in sequence. In relation to uh, the pressure from uh, water, it's really no different than it was before. Although the, the English institutions had a cap placed upon them, uh, that cap did not include Northern Ireland students. They're outside it and they were to stop cannibalisation from one institution to another. Okay. However, as the grades get, get uplifted and, and more students have um, better grades, of course, their choices to self-release uh, and to go and find other places, which may include institutions in England, gets, um, gets enhanced. But actually, we always have that risk within the late part of this market through clearing as, as students um, came to, to, to understand uh, what, what they had. In relation to the, the viability of Ulster University in, in, in terms of the multi-campus, I think we know we've had it independently verified recently that there's about £15 million pounds a, a year a, a additional uh, cost that, that, that we bear in relation to maintaining uh, that operation. We, we, we understand that where the, the student-led, demand-led dynamics um, places, um, uh, Belfast is a, a very... Um, attractive proposition for students that underpins one of the reasons why, why we are investing in a new Belfast campus that will help us to consolidate our Jordanstown offer. And although that looks to be quite Belfast centric, it isn't really for all the reasons that you've said around the, the viability of a multi campus institution. We need to ensure that the vision that we currently have on Jordanstown and the income that we derive from that can continue. And I think the, um, we've found that, as I, as I look at the table draw, drawing down, I'm confident our Belf, existing Belfast proposition will, will fill, fill, but uh, we will still have, and we do still have, a, a number of places at, at Jordanstown. So the, the viability of the institution as a multi-campus, regional, missioned institution is to ensure that uh, we have a good proposition in Belfast to shore up the demand and the income that we would draw from there to be able to support the entire institution to continue to deliver for the regional campuses uh, in Coleraine and indeed uh, in London Derry, Derry McGee. Uh, and that's really important to us. So I, I, I do understand those, those questions where that campus looks a bit Belfast-centric, but actually it's Ulster-centric for us to be able to continue to achieve and deliver on our multi-campus um, mission. Um, I, I fear I may have forgotten another part of your question 
I, I wonder if there's something I missed. You can just remind me of the bit that I might have forgotten. Um, I, I don't think there was a further question, but I will take this opportunity to maybe ask another. Um, so, um, you know, I, I take your point in relation to people being more attracted to Belfast, but, you know, I, since everybody has been on their staycation on the North Coast, I would hope that would indeed attract them to come and study at Corium because there's a real lifestyle um, issue there, and we can laugh about it, but I do actually think that's one of the things that we need to be selling in relation to the North Coast because it is a very different lifestyle as to what they might experience within the cities. Um, I suppose, it, um, again, this is to kind of come on, it might be better direct toward Queens who may have difficulty fulfilling those original uh, conditional offers. Are we anticipating um, a number of deferrals or are we advocating that for students maybe who have lost their place? And I know that's not necessarily um, uh, indicative at this stage. Um, and, and I'm also keen to understand that every student, regardless of the, the COVID situation and, and the A-level upgrade, would have an opportunity to appeal their gra grades, and they would probably do that on the basis that they would hope to get a, a higher grade that would get them into their original course. D does the um, the universities tend to give a almost a, a waiting period before releasing their place, anticipating that someone may appeal their grade and then um, you know uh, be successful, and then their original conditional offer should be fulfilled. Um, yeah, so I can uh, perhaps start to answer that and then Paul, Paul may want to add. So um, certainly in terms of Queen's, again, and I'm sorry to keep repeating this, but until we see the actual centre assessed grades, it's hard to know how many um, students we might need to be saying, you know, we're guaranteeing a deferred entry for next year. We are very mindful that that not only has a knock on, um, that not only has an impact for this cohort of students, but it has a particular knock-on impact in terms of available places for next year for the cohort of students coming the year behind them. Uh, and we, we need to make sure any decisions we make in terms of this year's intake um, do not um, significantly disadvantage cohorts coming through who have also been majorly impacted by this current pandemic and missed out on uh, huge amounts of, of schooling in the same way as the current year cohort are. In terms of the modelling that we do, we do not um, we do not hold places open on, at an individual level it, uh, waiting for appeal. What we would do is we would um, take an assessment across the board, across a subject area, as to um, how many places we would keep vacant in the event of an appeal. Um, we were particularly mindful this year that appeals were very likely. There's always, there's always the potential for that in any year. But this year we were particularly alert to the fact that there may be an, in, an increased number of appeals and that there may indeed uh, be some leniency towards uh, those appeals as well. What we could not really have allowed for was um, the, the sort of scale of increase um, that we might be facing through moving to centre assessed grades. And we, whilst we don't have the, the specific information for Queen's, we do understand that for A and A star grades at A level, that is along, along the lines of a 10 percentage point increase um, from the original grades last week to the centre um, assessed grades. So the 10 percentage point increase in the number of A's and A stars is going to have a significant impact and that will be far larger than the proportion of places we would have kept um, in reserve to deal with any appeals. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. And I probably don't have too much to, to add to that. The context is perhaps um, similar in, in, in most ways in terms of how we would manage um, provision. Um, because of our multiple uh, campuses, uh, uh, we have quite an uneven distribution of places, so it's important that we look at things in, in the round. We try to work out, we have a plan about what we're, our targets and where we need to go to, but we're also careful, and we have done in the, over the last year, to try to ascertain what our maximum course carrying capacity is. And although in ordinary times we wouldn't necessarily expect to fill right up to the course carrying capacity on every single program we, we we at least know intellectually that we have some stretch possibility in some programs and that will suffice to give us the, the, the contingency for such things as as appeals okay, okay thank you um gary thanks chair and uh, congratulations paul as well on your appointment and look forward to seeing you sometime in the northwest in the near future um we're blessed, of course, to have two great universities. Uh, I think we can all say that. Um, 
The difficulty that I have is that, and you may have heard my previous comments from the department we're in, but in the last line of the uh, briefing we've received from Ulster University, it refers to the fact that Ulster University is likely to have capacity in some of the areas that Qu uh, Queen's are saying they're oversubscribed. And I think therein lies the concern that I would have in that, you know, at this minute in time, you know, we're talking about several hundred unfilled places at McGee University. Um, lots of availability in some courses that I'm really shocked, to be honest, that the places aren't filled. At the same time, we have others calling for, you know, a thousand additional places or whatever number has been, been reported in the public domain. Who is that going to, to disadvantage? And my concern being that th that disadvantage will be to the, the, the regional mission, Paul, as you talked about. I, I would be concerned that at this moment in time, if we don't fill the spaces that we already have and we knee jerk and, and, and rush to a decision to increase places without dealing with that issue, I, I fear that that will, will have a, a detrimental effect, not just now in the short term, but in the long term. Just maybe just to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, and it's a, it's a complex picture. I mean, we, 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 we grow the, the provision in McGee in terms of the allowances that we make, and then we can accommodate the students that want to, to come there. And as we begin to fill courses consistently year on year, we will put, put investment in place to grow those courses uh, further in line with the expectations to, to have some group of that, that campus. That applies equally to the Coleraine campus. Indeed, uh, strategically, I have, as part of, of my thoughts, uh, the, the, the desire to want to move some of our uh, subject lines uh, northwards and northwestwards. Uh, that's important because it's that real estate that we have in um, Belfast it has, a, has a fixed footprint, and there's some logic there to want to reserve some of that for the non-regulated, the non-controlled space in terms of the part-time, the post-grad and the international, and that will allow us the best opportunity to grow our income to continue with the regional mission. So there is a long-term plan to want to uh, put, put there in, but we, we don't dictate the behaviours of, of students. Um, obviously, it's really important that young people get to, to choose. We absolutely accept that um, it's incumbent upon us to make those uh, courses attractive. And we do know that at the McGee campus, it, 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 especially, we consistently have high NSS uh, scores, the best within the, the Northern Ireland uh, sector there, and students have a, a, a great e experience. Um, we, we need to double down on that and, and ensure that we can grow that organically uh, from student, student demand. That does overlap, of course, with the wider proposition of, of those campuses. I was interested when your, your colleague was talking about the lifestyle campus that we have in Coleraine. That's also true. It's a lovely campus, lovely part, part, part of the world. And I think it, it, it represents a really um, significant offering. But, but it doesn't really matter too much to the degree to which we believe in those campuses and, and the propositions that are there. We, we have to respond to some of the market dynamics especially where we see that the current funding model is on a follow the student basis. There is a need going forward that in this exceptional year, if there is a, dis a, a decision to allocate existing funding, that we don't, we don't undermine Ulster University's attempt to offer better campus balance by introducing a cliff edge into the funding model that would see a simple money following the student in, in, in the next um, block grant allocation between, between the universities. I think that's certainly within the gift of, of what we could do together to ensure that the that, that Queen's may get some uh, support for the additional students that they're contractually obliged uh, to take. But I think it can't be at the expense of introducing a cliff edge into the overall funding model that sees it, it that, that it makes us a very, makes it more difficult for us at university to maintain its multi uh, campus uh, provision. I mean, we wouldn't wish to be incentivised to, to put more students uh, into the Belfast uh, proposition when we're trying to um, balance off. So it is a, a, a difficult one. We're committed to growing those courses, which will show that popularity. The city deals that we're entering into uh, are looking to have internationally significant um, centres of research, which will grow those subject areas and the reputations over a long period of, of time. And we believe that the undergraduate provision will follow on that. But it's not a switch that can be turned on just because we would all agree that we would like to have more students in that, that, that area. And even if we just 
throw money at the problem, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that students will, will follow. That will, will, will follow over time as we invest in those areas that students uh, wish, wish to study. Um, there may be some, um, some ways in which we can engineer that, but we have to be very careful to maintain uh, you know, a, a, a balanced system. It's probably enough from me there. And, uh, yeah, and uh, thank you, Paul. If, if I could add, I mean, we, we very much support you in that. And clearly, it's in all of our interests and in the interests of the Northern Ireland economy that we have a thriving HE sector for Northern Ireland right across the board. Um, so we would be supportive of that. As I said previously, that needs to be done in a planned way. Um, I, I fully appreciate the comments um, made by the committee member around not wanting to uh, make major decisions. However, I do feel I just need to, to mention that clearly for us here at Queen's, the decision, the policy decision was made on Monday around the decision that was made around A-level results, and we are simply responding to that. Um, and it is imperative that we get a, a quick resolution because our academic year starts on the 21st of September. And so to be able to plan for that delivery with students arriving on campus, sorting accommodation, sorting timetables, sorting the safe flow of people around the, the campus, we really don't have time um, to, to, to wait for a decision on this. We need the clarity to be able to, to, be, to do the right thing by those young people. Thanks for that, and I appreciate that comment. I, uh, you know, however, when I talk about knee-jerk reaction, what what I mean is that, you know, there needs to be more collaboration, possibly. Um, you know, John talked about you know megaphone style stuff across social media and statements, but issue. I think there just needs more collaboration. Uh, if we're sitting in London Dairy with, um, you know, three four hundred spare places, and Queens is hoovering up, you know, uh, uh, looking for additional places, then it's important that th th there's a fair spread. And of course, that, you know that that's where we're coming from. I, I did talk I, about. I, I did talk about. I just respond to those comments um, because it does concern me that the talk about uh, the, the megaphone um, diplomacy. Um, just to be clear, both universities have been in constant touch, in touch, um, in the lead up to the A level results and every day since the A levels were, were, were released last Thursday. And similarly, we have had conversations every day with the department since the A level results. So there is a lot of dialogue going on behind the scenes that I appreciate might not be visible, but I think it's important that you're, you're aware of that. Um, in terms of the wider collaboration, um, and it's not particularly in terms of the challenges we're talking about today, but um, I know both Paul and myself, or our Vice Chancellor here at Queen's University, would very much appreciate the opportunity to come back and talk to you again about the great work we're doing around City Deal in collaboration. And whilst that's not about um, uh, student places uh, at undergraduate level, it really does feed very much in terms of the, the skills pipeline and how that will benefit Northern Ireland. So we would really like to, an opportunity to talk to you in the future about the work we're doing there in collaboration. Thanks for that, and, and, and that's fine. In terms of the, I did say about the two great universities, but of course we do have uh, many excellent FE colleges as well. Uh, many of those people are concerned that, again, when we look at um, additional places, what sort of impact that that's going to have on them. And you know, when we talk about collaboration, I, I just wanted to hear from yourselves in terms of you know, what engagement do you have with your colleagues in the FE sector? Thank you, I'll kick off on that. We, I have a, uh, an excellent relationship with all of the principals. I, I, I meet with them uh, regularly and I meet with them with um, DFE uh, colleagues um, too. So we have a, a, a tripartite. Uh, meeting. Ulster University has around 7,000, val will val validate the, the awards of around 7,000 students uh, across uh, the colleges, and although we would see probably about 10% um, of those um, come through into our HE provision, it prepares them for HE provision uh, elsewhere. I think the regionality of those um, campuses um, is, is, is something to um, protect uh, and, and, and to, to, to nurture. I think it offers uh, a great option for, for a, a bunch of potential students who, who uh, might find it difficult for either geography reasons or um, the sorts of courses on offer um, to, to attend into the, the, the universities. And um, we have a lot of articulation arrangements uh, where they go from one to the other. And I think it's really important 
that we consider the whole system of Northern Ireland and the skills escalator that, that, that goes through from level three, four, five, six, and indeed beyond. Uh, I know that that's um, been really fertile ground in the apprenticeship space too. And I've had um, regular conversations and, and indeed have, have provided direct support uh, for colleges in terms of um, the design of apprenticeship programs that um, are a better fit for, for the market and can be supported by the institutions. I also think that there's been bits and pieces that we have learned from, from the colleges in terms of work-based provision and how our um, level um, six provision and beyond can um, work with that. It will be a bit of a culture shock for those who've done work-based provision at levels four and five in a college to come into a wholly academically aligned level six. And, and that's been part and parcel of that, that fruitful relationship. I think you're right though, that there are risks here the risks, though, don't necessarily take, aren't, aren't really around um, the student intakes. They're simply a consequence of, of uh, grades going up. And when grades go up, students will have more choices. And I think it's natural that uh, as a consequence of that, Queen's will end up with, with, with more students. Some of those uh, will be at the expense of, of the, the, the colleges and, and, and perhaps even ourselves. And as a consequence of students having better grades, uh, those students may end up with us instead of at, at, at colleges. So I do think that um, the, the grade shift does have ramifications for, for, the, for the college um, sector, um, but, but nonetheless, it's, it's a whole system and, and, and we need to, to look at that. And, and I think as Joe has eloquently said, we're, we're all playing kind of the cards that we've been dealt here, um, but, but we are all committed, I think, to supporting the Northern Ireland HE system, which is excellent across the board. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely echo and support that. Um, we do work closely with the FE colleges, um, particularly because we have a very strong relationship with Belfast Met. Um, and we would always work with them to, as, as you discussed with the department earlier on today, um, look at how we can continue to innovate with new pathways and, and different options for students to, to navigate through their, their academic career and, and on to um, further employment. Um, I do think it's an area where there is um, scope going forward for us to um, work in a, a continued way, looking to see if there's more innovation we can introduce into that space. Uh, and like I say, working on a, a system-wide approach for FE and HE collectively, and we would be very keen to work with the department on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sinead? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, Joe, I'm having a bit of difficulty in, in hearing you. I'm, I'm mm. listening very closely. I'm, yeah. So forgive me if I'm, I want you to clarify a couple of things that you said earlier on. You talked about 3,000 students in 2019, and um, th th this year it was 4,300 students. What was that? Was that applications, or was that that were given conditional offers? Could you just explain what those figures were and the difference? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's the quality of my microphone or my, my Scouse accent, maybe. <laughs> no, no, I don't I'll think it's true. Right. Right. Um, hopefully you can hear me. So our actual intake for um, Northern Ireland and EU undergraduates last year was 3,300, just, just over 3,300. So that's the number of uh, students who actually came in as new intake to Queen's last year. The comparable figure as of today of students who we have absolutely confirmed have a place and will start with us at the start of term on the 21st of September is 4,300. So that's an additional 1,000 students that we have committed already at our own risk to take into Queen's for this academic year compared to last academic year. And that is before we take into account any uplift as a result of the centre assessed grades. And how many of them students last year and now this year are, are MASM? The MASM so, numbers uh, attached to both of them, sorry. Yeah, so last year all of the 3,300 would have been within our MASM number. This year those additional 1,000 students that we have taken will take us over our MASM even after we allow for the additional 192 places, um, which is the 5% additional that Philip referred to from the department earlier. 
Right, and, and you, Ben mentioned you, you give a few dates. You, you said, and I think it's in connection with clearing, you, you mentioned that the clearing, you, you did it very quickly um, to give students, um, uh, I suppose, to, to take away some of the stress of them waiting for clearing and that. So could you give me the time frame of when clearing normally takes place and clearing this year, uh, how, how quick the clearing was this year? Yeah, so um, actually it, it always happens very quickly at clearing. So, so what happens is when the A-level results are released, universities are in receipt of those results um, prior to the students receiving them. So we would um, receive them uh, just less than a week before the students actually receive them. And that allows us to plan for, at the point at which the students receive their A-levels, how many of those students we will um, confirm their places, so that's we call it confirmation and clearing. So we confirm places for those students who fully met the terms of their offer. In other years, sometimes we would have a discussion about shall we confirm some students who just narrowly missed the terms of their offer, and then um, we would open up to, through clearing, for students to apply to universities who maybe haven't initially applied to a university, but now are looking for a place to clearing. So confirmation is for the students who have applied um, through the normal applications process, and we make decisions once we get the A-level results on how many of those we will accept. And then clearing is if we have any additional available students, how many more we might accept. Um, now this year, um, because we knew of the, the unprecedented circumstances, um, Queen's has only been confirming students who met the terms of, of our offer um, and then um, really not having very much flexibility at all in those near-miss students. In previous years, we would perhaps have more flexibility in terms of near-miss. But when I talk about it happening quickly, from the point at which the students got their A-level, their initial A-level results on Thursday last week, um, to the change in policy around A-levels on Monday. Yeah. All of those confirmation decisions had already been made and the places filled prior to the decision on Monday. So we weren't, we weren't really still in the process of confirmation and clearing, apart from a very small number of undersubscribed subject areas. Joe, that was exceptionally quick. Um, I know having two daughters going through the, the, the system, um, it, it took more than 48 hours, certainly, um, sometimes to, uh, to, to, to get that clear. So that was exceptionally quick. Where you, uh, from, from Queen's University, were you um, taking those extra students on at your own financial risk because you hadn't got the mazen against them? Yeah, so some of those students would have been within the bracket of our mazen. Um, and I don't want to get into too much granularity here, but um, as I think the department were referring to earlier on, um, we, we have as institutions been given scope um, since an initial reduction in numbers in 2015 to take on additional students incrementally, but without additional funding. And so we had decided as an institution that we weren't able to maintain the quality of the educational experience for our students if we were to go right up to the department's Mazen in previous years without any additional funding to support that. So effectively, you know, there's been no inflation uh, since 2015 and our costs are increasing at a significant rate, particularly in the space of pensions, uh, staff pensions, which I'm sure you'll be aware of. Every additional 1% on pensions for our workforce costs Queen's another million pounds and our pension commitments have gone up by um, a significant number of percentage points. So um, in previous years, we have not gone to the absolute limit of our maximum Mazen. This year, and we did confirm with the department and with the minister that we were planning to do this, we agreed that it was only fair to the students in Northern Ireland that we would absolutely maximise on the Mazen that was available to us, despite the fact that as a university that meant we would be incurring additional costs for which we might not get additional funding. But the numbers that we, we now have mean that we, we are already over that Mazen, um, which is why we're saying we won't be able to accommodate additional students without additional funded places. 
So just to, to, that I understand this correctly, Joe, you've got an additional 1,300 students um, that have got offers um, fr from last year, and Queen's are, 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 are thinking now that they need another 500 to 1,000 in order to meet the new commitments uh, of the teachers' uh, predictions. Uh, uh, am I right here? So, so that's over and above. So um, that first figure, it's an additional 1,000, so it went from 3,300 yeah. to 4,300, so an additional 1,000. And then, yes, we, we are looking um, to get support and additional funding, additional places to be able to meet whatever demand comes through from those students who, with the new centre assessed grades, meet the terms of our offer. We don't know whether that will be 500 or 1,000 or any other number until we actually get the centre assessed grades. So the numbers that have been quoted so far, the, um, the, the, the maximum sort of 1,000 is based on the number of students that we rejected who didn't meet the terms of our offer on the grades that were published last Thursday. Right, okay. I mean, that's very significant in financial terms, in terms of, of, of what uh, Queen's may be uh, requesting. Um, and they also uh, would like to know, in, in terms of... Um, International students, what are your numbers like this year compared to last year? So for international students, um, it's still very early in the cycle. Even in a normal year, we wouldn't have a real sense. We, we will know how many students have um, accepted an offer of a place. But quite often you will see significant attrition, and this is right across the sector, not specific to Queen's, between the number of students who accept a place and the number of students who actually turn up at the start of term. So normally that would not be confirmed until later in the cycle. This year, um, we were very concerned earlier in the year about the impact that the COVID and the pandemic would have on our international numbers, and it's still a very real concern. So our financial modelling in that space, um, as I think we've quoted before at this committee, um, is across the board. We, we could be falling short on income on anything um, best case scenario from 30 million to worst case scenario getting close to 90 million, largely as a result of um, a reduction in international student recruitment against our plans. That said, we have seen a significant increase in the number of applications from international students for Queen's this year. Um, and some of that is in response to a very concerted effort around deliberate strategy to grow our international student population. So we've seen um, circa a 20% increase in applications. We're also seeing that um, flow through into acceptances and even students paying deposits for programmes, deposits for accommodation. Um, and as you might know, um, we had arranged for some chartered flights to guarantee safe transit of students into Belfast and uh, a very high uptake of, of, of those chartered flights uh, from China and we were looking to um, secure something similar for India as well. Um, so the, the signs are good, but we really can't predict what will happen. And if we start to see infection rates rise across the UK and in Northern Ireland specifically, that's still got the potential to have a really damaging impact on that international student recruitment. Okay, so your numbers, international students, your numbers are up this year. 20% rise. Well, we, we don't know until the students actually turn up. In terms of applications, the application numbers are up, yes. Okay, so the increased numbers of, of students that you, you made through the normal MASM was not to make up for the international students because you're still secure in, in that aspect of it? Yeah, we, we don't conflate the, uh, the home students with the international students because obviously they're funded uh, under very different models. And sorry, uh, just uh, to speak very briefly, sorry, Chair, but just to speak very briefly to Paul as well. Um, Paul, first of all, congratulations on your new appointment, uh, and I look forward to working with you. Um, you mentioned uh, that, that you feel that Belfast, uh, your Belfast campuses uh, will, will be fully subscribed, and, and you said that there are um, some subject areas may be oversubscribed. Can you, can you talk me through the, the subjects that you potentially see now it's been oversubscribed in your in your Belfast campuses? 
Um, well, I don't have I don't have that specificity in in, in front of me here, um, but they will be in the, the, the subjects that are delivered on that campus, which are arts based, um, the, the fine art and um, the architecture uh, programs uh, potentially. Uh, and and again, until we get those numbers that are that are coming through, we have some hospitality there as well. It's a fairly uh, small portfolio of courses uh, that, that that we have. Uh, I would anticipate that we would um, fill there, but we would still be in that space that Joe was talking about until that we get the confirmation of the numbers. We put that across to our campus carrying capacity, but I would an an anticipate that we will uh, more than fill uh, across those programs, which are largely arts-based, uh, with, a, with a bit of um, architecture and a bit of uh, hospitality and, and, and tourism in that space. And then the other, the other, um, I, I want to maybe tease out what, what you think the solutions are. Um, obviously, we've got sub-regional campuses within within the Ulster uh, portfolio. Um, why do you think some of the courses are not attractive in, in, in either Coleraine or, or, or Derry? I think why, there are think a, a, a variety of, of reasons. Some of them are demographic in terms of just where the, the, the population are and the communication mm -hmm. links from various parts of, of the, the country. Uh, I think the, the subject lines um, are probably uh, about, about right. There's certainly clear, it's certainly clear as we look at um, some of our programs that we know we, we could um, grow them in terms of the available spaces and we think that we would fill them. Uh, there are a couple of programs that I know that are already uh, full, full at the McGee campus um, that, that comes under this rather than the commission courses like nursing. So the, the, the sport and exercise, physiology and health wellbeing are, are, the, are really the only two courses that are completely full there. Um, there are other programs that I think are really fantastic provision. Uh, well, all the courses there are a really fantastic provision. It gets really high uh, NSS. And, and, and I think it's the entirety of the of, of, of the proposition. I, I, I think that the school's liaison piece that we need to do probably needs to get better. That's something that I'm uh, committed to doing through my tenure as, as, I, as I come in to touch base with um, schools and, in, and ensure that the fantastic offerings that we have at, at Coleraine and at, at McGee are, are pushed through in relation to schools. I think that we could do a lot, uh, a lot better in the liaison with principals and, and careers teachers and I think that that's where we see we will have to do the activity to grow those numbers but it's a, a, a bit about what I said earlier it's not a switch that we can just switch on and, and, and people will, will come we're committed to growing that we have to if you like ride the waves where we see there's some popularity uh, we have to take an approach of being quite data centric about what what are people studying at secondary school how does that align we have to work in the other direction to see what the businesses need. We have our own policy center and the skills uh, barometer that helps us somewhat to, to build uh, courses. But it, but it isn't always the case that the courses that industry want are the ones that students want to do. We know that from the, from the STEM subjects and the, the difficulties there's been in recent years around computing and engineering, despite the, the pay premium in those courses and the availability of, of jobs and so forth. But we certainly have to work with secondary schools to, to, to get that data uh, and we have to um, build our own um, pipelines in those areas and we're, we're, we're committing we're, we're, we're committed to doing that some of the other things that we can do and i, I spoke about it earlier in this meeting is, is proactively move some of our subject areas uh, northwards uh, colleagues will, will know that um, there's a public consultation that's um, pending going out in the next um, couple of weeks or so around the, the, the health sciences where we're still looking at uh, all campuses but we have a, a preferred option. There are other um, subject areas that I'll also be exploring through, through, through my tenure so that we can do something on the supply side. Um, there are clear business rationales for, for doing that around our campus balance and, and using the Belfast campus to grow non-regulated provision uh, and it's not going to be a one size or, or a one solution solution we'll have to use a range of, of initiatives to, to to build that but we are committed to doing it paul i really welcome um that response and i do believe that you know we need to engineer this as well um, and we have, if we want growth and development in the sub-regions, we have to engineer it. And there is a, a, a deficit in the marketing 
um, of, of the two campuses, uh, Coleraine and, and Derry. But certainly, I think that you need to work with Derry City and Strabane District Council uh, and market that campus because it is a fabulous campus. It has got brilliant facilities. Um, there has been investment in it, but there hasn't been an investment uh, by UU in the engineering part of it, engineering the growth and development in it, and the marketing <coughs> dynamics, and that has to change. And I hope that during your tenure that that will change, and it needs to change quickly. Thank you for that. I'm happy to give my, my, my commitment in relation to uh, looking at that. Thanks very much. Um, John Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'll be brief because many of my points have been covered by everybody else so far. Can I first of all congratulate you, Peter, on your new role and wish you the very best for the University of Ulster and, and with your time in charge and look forward to meeting with you soon and working with you. Uh, can I congratulate both organisations too, uh, not only for the way that you're dealing with this very difficult situation through no fault of your own, um, but also with the way that the two institutions have adapted to deal with the situation that has arisen by COVID-19 in terms of um, working from home and, and the way that the academic institutions have just have been flexible in working with their students, I think it is to be commended. Um, you mentioned a couple of the key words in all this, Peter, and it is balance and flexibility, and I think that's what we need to see. We're still very much in the dark ahead of the actual results being released by UCAS tomorrow, and until we have those, we're not really going to know what the numbers. We have a rough idea, but we won't really know. There are, as Gary has said sometimes, and you've raised it in your briefing note here, some areas in which um, UJ or universities or you've also, sorry, could pick up the slack from Queen's. There may well be others where that's not the case, and we won't know that. Um, hopefully, working collaboratively, the two institutions can maybe find the situations where that does arise and work together to funnel that across. But there will be situations where people were, were made an offer, have achieved those grades, and through no fault of their own or an institution, aren't able to get that place at Queen's and aren't able to do that course at University of Ulster and don't want to do a course there. And we might lose them to somewhere else, somewhere else in the UK. So we need a flexible approach from the department, working with yourselves and to see yourselves working collegially for all the young people to ensure that there are places there. Um, if I could just ask two questions in terms of Queenso, in terms of the need for, over, for um, extra numbers potentially. Um, in terms of teaching capacity, Joe, could you tell us, I mean, if you're looking at potentially between 500 and 1,000 extra students, do you have the teaching capacity there, given that some courses have a maximum amount of students per academic staff? Um, and how would that be how would that be balanced out? I mean, is that something that's going to prove difficult? And also with the restrictions around, I know it was alluded to earlier, it was ages ago now in this discussion about the restrictions around COVID. I mean, how difficult is that going to be um, going forward with the additional numbers as well? Thank you, folks. Yeah, thank you. And I very support uh, very much support you in the comments you've made there um, around the sort of balanced approach. Um, in terms of teaching capacity, there is no doubt that any additional numbers over and above the numbers that we have already confirmed is going to be um, very challenging for us here at Queen's, but we are committed to being agile and adapting. Um, and as you commented, commented earlier on, um, you know, the institution, uh, and that really is absolute uh, all credit and thanks to our workforce, have responded tremendously um, during this crisis to really support our students. Um, so we are committed to trying to deliver on that challenge as I've, I've said earlier today, it really depends on which subject areas these additional student numbers come through. Um, in some subject areas, it's areas where um, if we don't have the teaching capacity, um, there are mechanisms where we can flex up fairly quickly. And the, the recruitment market is such that we would be confident that we could recruit any additional staff that we need to deliver on that. In other subject areas, it's much more challenging space to recruit. Um, and then you layer on top of that the challenges of, of sometimes trying to attract people to Northern Ireland if they're not already based in Northern Ireland. Um, and there may be areas where we simply will not have the workforce to deliver additional numbers. Um, but I can't be any more specific until we've seen the centre assessed grades. Thanks, Joe. Right, thank you. If I could just, just to come up with one more point. In terms of those numbers that you're talking about, the, the additional numbers who potentially will achieve the grades for the places they've been offered, that, is that solely UK students, or sorry, Northern Ireland students, or is that a plethora of students applying from all over the UK and, at, at this stage? It's, uh, it's Northern Ireland and EU students, uh, but it's fair to say that the vast majority of them are actually Northern Ireland students. We have a relatively small number of GB students, 
So of the um, 4,300 I referred to that we have confirmed places, around 370, 380 of those are from GB um, and very small numbers from the Republic or the rest of the EU. So it is largely Northern Ireland students. I mean, 90% plus of those waiting for a place are Northern Ireland students, at least. Well, I mean, there will be students from, from across the board from that cohort who may get um, sent to assess grades that are higher than the grades they've been currently awarded. Okay. So there could be students uh, from, from England uh, or from the rest of the GB in that, but they're, they're very small in terms of our original offers, those proportions of those students, simply because it follows demand. Okay, thank you both. Thank you. Donald Dowd. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you to you both for your presentations thus far. Uh, Joe, can I just ask, in relation to the thousand extra pupils that our students are, that Queens are taking on board this year, how do you get uh, approval for that from the department, or is that a decision Queens can make solely? We don't require formal approval from the department um, as an autonomous institution. However, in the spirit of partnership and collaboration that we referred to earlier today. We have kept the, the minister and the department and, and the, the University of Ulster um, fully in the loop with our plans all the way through this. So they were aware that that was going to be our planned approach and they were aware around the timelines to which we were working. But no, we don't require approval because we can act autonomously. Okay. Um, uh, the reason I ask it is quite a significant increase in numbers, not just for the university, but also in terms for the infrastructure of Belfast and South Belfast in terms of traffic, public transport, housing, uh, and all the, all the associated uh, issues that go with that. Now, if we add potentially 1,000 students to that, or 500 students to that, while you, you have made a commitment that the university will endeavour to do their very best to provide uh, the teaching courses, etc., and depends on the courses, I do have serious concerns about the impact and, uh, on, on Belfast, and this goes for UU as well, because they will end up with extra students as well, but particularly on this issue, I have serious concerns about the environmental impact, the infrastructure impact on Belfast of an unplanned increase of students to that degree. And how, I know Queen's is full of very, very clever people, but how can you plan within a matter of weeks to take in Seven hundred students you weren't expecting. So um, the, the planning around the decision that we've made on the offers made so far has been going on for, for much longer than, than uh, a short number of weeks. This has been going on right the way through our admission cycle, um, and we already at this point in the year would now be planning. Um, for our strategy around admissions for 2021. So there's quite a long lead time to that. Um, I, I mean, I, I take on board the point. Um, the institution does have a strategy of, of growth, um, and uh, ideally, we would like to see that growth that comes through in a way that brings inward investment to Northern Ireland, um, uh, and we are committed to delivering on that. But equally, we work very closely in partnership with a number of uh, sort of multi-agency partners across, and we would work very closely with the city council, with the local community with um, the private landlords and the, the major accommodation providers um, within Belfast and the Belfast city region. Um, and uh, we equally, in terms of the environmental impact you talk, you talk to, uh, we have a very clear strategy and a very good track record there, actually, of, of seeing some great, uh, great results. So it's really part of this holistic system-wide approach um, and part of a, a strategy to try and uh, grow the economy of Northern Ireland and to put us on a more competitive footing um, with some of our um, perhaps comparative regions in other parts of the UK. Okay, uh, and, uh, just a question for Paul and add my congratulations uh, to your appointment. Um, in terms of moving forward, uh, there's going to be a significant number of additional students uh, and hopefully attending universities uh, locally. Again, I, I would urge a, a regional balance in this, and you have the opportunity to do that in terms of your other campuses. Where would you plan? Of course, it depends on the courses the students are taking, but courses are flexible and can be moved. 
Well, where would you hope to see that investment take place? I mean, we say that the, the courses are flexible and can be moved, but the moving of the course um, is, is really quite expensive if there's um, specialised equipment and uh, the additional staff costs that go around in, uh, travel, certainly in the, the short term and so forth. And indeed, in the um, for, for the health sciences move, which we know will move from, from Jordanstown in, in, in due course, the scenario planning that we did in relation to that, depending on which campus it ends up, uh, had, a, had a, a low figure of around 5 million and a, and a high figure around 9 million. So it isn't something that we can just take on uh, lightly in relation uh, to doing that. But nonetheless, I feel it is incumbent upon us to bring forward that, that, that campus um, balance. In terms of, of, of trying to address the, the lumpiness of our provision uh, across campuses, at the moment we do have a, a, a system, and when, when I say we, I mean the, the HE system, uh, generally, that is uh, driven by a student choice, it's, it's demand-led. And the only way really that we can influence that is to in ensure that we have outstanding uh, provision where we would wish to rebalance um, to. Um, there is some courses, and I, I, I've covered that in terms of we can electively move, but we don't have unlimited resource to just pick things up. And We've seen the impact of what's happened here around student choice. We, we know that it's easier to fill courses in Belfast. Every time we move uh, a programme northwards, we have to be sure that we can still um, fill it. The way in which funding is deployed within the sector in Northern Ireland means that if we, um, if we create a situation whereby demand is reduced for Ulster and the number of students goes, goes down because of uh, geographical uh, preferences, that reflects through in our bottom line and that undermines our ability to continue to sustain uh, our multi-regional, sorry, our multi-campus regional mission. So for us, it, 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 it's always that um, dilemma of we have to be very sure that any movements can uh, be sustained in the marketplace um, and, and any change in geography means that you're probably um, accessing a slightly different segmentation of the demographic across the region. So we would normally make those decisions or have the opportunity to make those, those decisions where we have very high multiples of, of applicants to places. And then we can feel that the elasticity of demand is such that a, a course move won't necessarily undermine our, our, our finances. But that's a sign from the fixed costs of, of moving uh, the, the equipment, refurbishing, rebuilding, or whatever we need to do to, to accommodate that. So it's a complex picture. Um, it, it's something that, that, that we, we are doing currently uh, now with the health sciences and, and, and the consultation. We'll continue um, to do, but we don't have unlimited uh, resource to, to take a supply side approach uh, and just in, in endure the consequences of allow that demand to regrow over a period of time. We, we would come under severe financial shortages if we took those sorts of uh, risks in, in the short to medium term, even if there were longer term, term gains. Term gains, sorry. Okay, Paul, can I ask, uh, as a result of Queen's increasing their intake by 1,000, did Oxford University lose students as a result, or did the overall student numbers go up? No, we definitely lost students, but I think we have to be fair to Queen's and, and not say this isn't because Queen's aren't taking them. This is because the grades got inflated and what we were seeing were students who perhaps had their firm commitment at Queen's and their insurance offer with Ulster. What that has, has, has meant is that they perhaps in the first round of results did not get their grade for, for Queen's. Queen's has allocated the, the, the place to uh, someone else. They've come to us uh, as their insurance rate, and now they're in a position of perhaps getting uh, upgraded. They're still in, in, in the system. They're perhaps expecting to go to Queen's, and, and that is the way that, the, 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 that it's going to work, but it's on the basis of students having different grades. But, but, no, but sorry, yes. I, I, mean, I mean the original decision by Queen's to increase their numbers by 1,000. I'm not talking about the implications of the recent A-level results. Yeah. Did, did, uh, well, the, that, that, would ine that would inevitably have had an impact if they gave out more offers, they give it out to the same student population. Yeah. And if there was a preference to go to Queen's, uh, they, they would take that. The, 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 the percentage is difficult for us to, to, to know and the numbers, but um, the, the key number here that would help us understand uh, what's gone on in, in this year is to, to work out 
whether um, the numbers that have gone over the water have gone up or gone down or stayed the same. That will tell us where the redistribution has been at Ulster's expense, college's expense, or just at the expense of universities over the water. Without that statistic, I think we can guess that there would have been some of that movement. It'd be difficult to put, put a, a, a number on it. I would expect it to um, be, be, well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to guess without that, without that data. Um, but if, if, if we do know the impact of students going over the water, we'd be in a much better position to know what the internal redistribution has been as a consequence of that. But I'm confident that there has been some redistribution. And if I can just be absolutely clear, the additional thousand students that we've already confirmed, that those students are, um, after we allow for the extra 5% within our Mazen, so Queen's has not made a decision to recruit an additional thousand students over and above the massive number that had been uh, given to us by DEFI. Um, when I say we take the, we've taken those additional students and it's at Queen's risk, the risk to Queen's is, um, although it's within the Mazen, we're taking them with no guarantees of extra funding, which means it's diluting our overall unit of resource per student. Okay. I'll just make a final comment. Um, um, Given the <clears throat> long-term implications of the outcome of the A-level results, uh, I, I think what, and I know some in the room may not like me saying this, but this needs a ministerial intervention. I don't think this should be left up simply to the universities to uh, decide where an extra potentially 1,200 students are going, given that universities are economic drivers, uh, given that uh, it has long-term implications, even for next year's applications, etc. Uh, and given the regional imbalances that we already have in our education system, I think this does require uh, a ministerial intervention. Okay, thank you, John. Um, thank you both for, for being with us today. It has been really helpful, and I guess I, I would just finish where I started as well, because we, we were talking about places here, but all of those places are, are young people, and um, it's their futures that is, is being decided here. Um, so I would very much encourage, um, as much as possible, that collaborative approach that, that you have talked about and that we have talked about, and it does have to have that whole system long-term approach to it as well. So look, thank you very much, and I'm sure we'll be in contact with you again soon. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we're moving on then. Mm. Okay. Well, do people have anything that they want to add there or anything? Any comments? Or? No? Okay. Um, so moving on then to um, item number four, which is any other business. And I, I mentioned at the start that we, we do want to hear from... <laughs> <laughs> Let me just extract myself from that. Um, from further education colleges um, and their principals perhaps next week. And that, that as we get the... We're hearing from Peter, are we? Just, just pretend I'm not on the screen. Pretend I'm not on the screen. Uh, I'd like to hear from the heating engineer. It's freezing in here. I get the windows closed and they'll be cold. No, we, we have tried oh, to close the windows. Um, I'm just going to close now. Oh, We're in the corner here. We didn't need to turn the heat down on you. You should turn just, the heat up, wouldn't you? Just ignore that. Just ignore It's very distracting. Hello. <laughs> I, can't, I can't seem to get rid of it. Um, um, apologies, people. Oh, there we go. Oh, very good. No. Oh, no, we haven't. Oh, there we oh, go. There we go. <laughs> Someone has saved us. Thanks, <laughs> Thank um, you. No, obviously, with the GCSE results coming out tomorrow, that, that, that also um, will have an impact on further education, in particular um, for the, the likes of our apprentice places. And I think maybe if we can collate some questions, uh, if anybody has them, mm -hmm. to, to direct towards the department around um, the BTECs and apprentices, because there are still some issues there. Um, and also, um, the reopening of FE, I think, is something that we maybe need mm -hmm. to have a, a focus on um, and have had some um, feedback from, from the trade unions in relation to that. So it would be useful to get an update from the department about the advisory and oversight group and the work of that and the consultation that they have done with the unions in respect of reopening. Mm. Claire. 
Yeah, I suppose just to add, to, add on to that, particularly in relation to the BTEC, um, it was disappointing that we weren't able to get an update from the department in relation to that, and I am concerned that it almost looks like this issue has been overlooked, particularly by the executive and the committee. That may not be the case, but I am concerned I don't want to send the wrong message to those students. And whilst we will be able to uh, speak with the FE colleges next week, I think there has to be something more immediate to demonstrate that actually we are on top of this and, and how this has been allowed to happen. Now, I recognise that BTECs are Pearson, which is typically an English board. I think there's a um, few English boards yeah. involved. But I would go as far as to say that this isn't the first time that there have been issues in relation to BTEC, and maybe there's something that we need to look into because in the midst of the coronavirus epidemic and all of that, I, I just, yeah, I, I think it's disappointing. I think Jim um, would have updated us, but we, we didn't have sound from. So okay. it may be a case of now getting in touch with it's him again. And, and I just if we can think fix it's that. maybe important that we get something mm. immediate, mm. just in the absence of his, you know, his technical issues. Well, we, so. we might try for as a, an immediate written update. Yes. You don't mean no, no. It was it was just to make a point. I think, in fairness, um, I agree with uh, Claire. But uh, in fairness, I think we were going to get that. Uh, yeah, yeah. But we, we do need to get it. Yeah. Uh, regardless of that, but also um, just uh, touching on the previous discussions that we've had as a committee, I appreciate we did reach out um, to the minister, but you know she she was uh, unavailable, uh, which, which is understandable given the, the circumstances we were in over this past four months. But are there any plans in terms of going forward to looking at that again? Uh, in terms of getting getting that, that briefing or update from the minister, yeah. as soon as but we were hoping oh, we, we were going to plan for the minister for our, our first official meeting back. Obviously, we're back now a couple of weeks yeah. in advance of that. Um, we can try to see if the minister would be yeah, so available next week, perhaps to give us. We a, can ask again. Yeah, an if, if that's the concern. Just being that you know, I, I think most of us are, are you know, in a similar position in terms of. You know, whilst the issue needs to be addressed, we need to make sure that it's addressed in a way that doesn't have effects, you know, on other people. If you know what I mean, you know, we need to address the student issue absolutely. But also, I think when we hear next week from the colleges, if we can piece all that together, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's it's vitally important. Jera, I suppose from the information we've had today, we anticipate that um, UCAS will have the established grades, the grades that are going to go forward to the universities either tomorrow or Friday, which means they will then know just exactly who's able to take up places, how many places will be filled. That will feed back to the department. The executive will be looking at the, the paper that's being put forward tomorrow. So I would assume then by, by next Wednesday the Minister might be in a better position to bring all of that together. So if members are content, um, we look to see if we can get the Minister next week in addition to the FE colleges. Yeah. 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 One more yes, on um, this is, I suppose, digressing from the, the issues we're talking about today, but I was lobbied heavily, and I know other members have in relation to a group that are calling themselves excluded NI. Yeah. And um, I, I do think their issue is ongoing, and I do think there's a feeling that you know we're, we're past that point in, re in relation to financial support. Um, I know they have said that they have requested a meeting with the minister that has been declined. Is there an opportunity, given the the impact of what they're telling us that it has is having for them, and I've no doubt that, that that it is having a very severe impact, that this committee would um, have a view to to having them present. This Chair, Peter. Yeah, it, it, it's we we haven't had a direct contact, and if members have received direct contact, yes, okay. they can forward that to us. Then that that can be direct okay, contact fair. with the committee. It's just we we haven't had anything okay. specifically okay. asking okay. or direct. I a think there, there may have been something on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're actually going back through our Twitter feed to see if anyone actually asked us a question. We we we're not we've not been able to pin that down. But ideally, all of my details are on the website. Um, if, if, if the, the organisation would like to be in front of the committee, if they can go on the Assembly website, go on the Economy Committee page, all of the direct contacts for myself and the office are there. And if they can just get us something direct, okay. so we have something to go and we know who to contact and we, yeah. we can set something yeah, up. Potentially could connect. Or if they can, yeah, if they can come through a member, that would be great. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Chair, just on that, the, the matter of further support is really a matter for the executive. Um, the surplus funding, as I understand, was re returned to uh, the department, and uh, there is a number of issues under consideration in relation to to other funding. But I am sure you are all aware of the, the recent funding that has been announced. I think just has been administered to the councils, mm -hmm. and that's just in one area in Origin North Denis has been released today. So that is welcome. 
and, and we appreciate that you know comes through DARD, I believe, and uh, communities. So, you know, that is um, will help to go towards sm helping a lot mm. of small businesses mm. in relation to uh, dealing with COVID issues. But I'm aware of the, the ongoing lobby that there is, and uh, the minister is aware of it. And um, we do recognise, I suppose, that you know we, we could be into even deeper water in relation to COVID. And this whole thing may need to be revisited again, even in more detail. But uh, we do appreciate the, you know, the concerns that are continue to be raised about the implications on business. Mm -hmm. I think we all recognise, especially mm -hmm. retail, it's not near where it was, mm -hmm. and probably will not be for many, many years. And we need to be doing our best to support it and business generally, yeah. and including manufacturing, which we're, we're all very much worried about. And particularly those businesses that didn't receive any support. The fact just on manufacturing is something we perhaps would need to push Invest NI on. We mm -hmm. raised it before. Invest NI, I believe, need to be proactive in trying to support existing business. And, you know, there's no good in chasing around the world for new business, whether our existing businesses are under threat. So anything we can do to influence Invest NI to further support existing businesses and sustain what we've got in, in the months ahead, I think, is, is, should be a priority for them. And I would urge us perhaps to write to Invest NI on that. And uh, indeed, we could raise it with the Minister whenever we meet her again, but I think it needs to be a priority. I think for us all, we, we feel deeply aggrieved when you listen to the media about lo job losses and you wonder what has been done to try and sustain those jobs, you know, and what efforts have been made by Invest NI and other agencies before these announcements are made. And I think we need to be proactive rather than reactive on these issues, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will support that uh, from Gordon. Uh, ju just back to the excluded NI stuff, I, I, I do support that. I think it is important that. Um, well, obviously, that they, you know, they've contacted, I think, MLAs individually, but that they do contact the, the, the uh, committee as well, so we can have something uh, formally. But, but in terms of, uh, it's not in correspondence, so I'm assuming we haven't had anything back, but you know, I, I, it was my understanding that the minister was to put a paper into the executive in terms of ideas or thoughts around the reallocation of the underspend. Um, have we had any correspondence to that? Uh, but also in the fact that uh, Gordon's point is absolutely right because you know there's already calls at this minute in time around the extending of furlough, looking at other schemes to uh, try and well when we get out the, the eat out scheme when it ends, where we're going to be in the fact that you know we looked at the Republic of Ireland and the, you know they're starting to shut down again. Mm -hmm. um, you know we could be in a situation where we're looking for additional schemes for those who already got something, mm -hmm. whereas those who got no support. Um, whatsoever, uh, you know, we can get into a second phase, and they will still have no support. So, it's about how we almost bring them to, to a par. But it's just, we, I think we need to just chase up that paper. Chair, we, we do have um, correspondence ready to go, um, as this was not intended to be um, a full mm -hmm. committee meeting. We, we've been holding that mm -hmm. correspondence for our first meeting of the cycle. My recollection is we haven't had anything specifically from the department uh, indicating um, the potential bids that the minister put in. Mm. Um, there has been an announcement subsequent to that of um, money that has been allocated by the executive for various things, including money, as has already been mentioned by, minister, by members, for apprenticeships yes. for town centres through uh, DERA and communities, yep. uh, various health spending and so on. So we're not really clear on, on whether that money came from the existing surplus we, we were already aware of. I think that's something then to seek clarification from. I know I had yeah. a response from the Minister and one from the Permanent Secretary indicating that a paper had went to the Executive. It had been discussed on the 29th of June, but the, the Minister was in further discussion, discussions with Executive colleagues. There was no detail on what bids were contained within the paper, so some further information around that perhaps would be useful. Yeah. yeah. I suppose that wasn't the only bid paper to. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, um, that members are agreed, we'll seek the minister to come next week to update on the HE situation and potentially um, on any future support around COVID and the FE colleges to 
let us know what their situation is because they'll have had GCSE results yeah. by that stage. Now, yeah. It should be less complicated and faster working because they know they're going to be getting the protected grades. Yeah, I think that that the money that was made available for the apprenticeship, yeah. some, were, some were hoping there would be some detail around that because obviously, you know, those apprentice programmes will be starting and employers need to know what support they're getting as well and you know we've had the discussions around the difficulties facing manufacturing and other sectors that will impact on their ability to take on apprentices as well. Mm. Sure, that's going to be the, the, the very key issue. I don't know whether members can remember back as far as 2009-2010. Um, um, I was with the Employment Learning Committee then and, and there was a, obviously the financial crash, there was a big downturn and the then Minister um, Sir Reg MP did a guaranteed apprenticeship place it was largely college based um, that guarantee for all 17 year olds I think still exists however it, it was still on the basis of being able to lift capacity within the colleges which obviously because of COVID um, yeah. is going to become incredibly complicated yeah. um, so it would be, be interesting to hear from the, the colleges next week about just where they see all of that sitting um, yeah yeah, very quickly, just to pick up on what Gordon had said in relation to Invest NI, um, off the top of my head, I remember at the outset of COVID, there was a suggestion that there were already existing funding uh, streams available within Invest NI where I think um, businesses who were connected with them were able to get, uh, previously they would have got them in stages, so they'd maybe got up to about 5k each, but they would have maybe got it a thousand at one point to help develop their business, a thousand at another and whatever else. I, I, I do take your point in, in, in what you're trying to say, but I, I suppose for me it's about trying to support those who haven't received anything, and I'm trying to look at other opportunities for those uh, businesses, because in most cases the people who have been excluded are entrepreneurs, and you know they, they are new startups, and that's why they, they have been excluded, essentially. So are there existing programmes that we could potentially point them in that direction? I'm, I'm trying to be um, positive about it because it's, it's all very well you know, saying they haven't gotten anything, but that doesn't help them. It certainly doesn't help the minister or anyone else. You know, so could we, you know, is there, could we, in addition to the correspondence, if, if Gordon and other members of the committee would be content, could we, um, could we see if they are trying to explore ways to maybe utilise existing programmes, indeed any um, of the statutory agencies, um, so that we could find them an opportunity? Because maybe the reality is, is that there's no money, but is it somewhere? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we find it down the back of the sofa somewhere, you know, to, to try and um, help them? Because they are, you know, it's it's um, it's desperate, and I would really like to hear their story because I think the human cost of this has been lost a little bit as we have moved forward, and um, and I think it's an important narrative. So, thank you. So, if, if members are content, then Great. Um, we write to invest along all those lines. Great, thank you. Um, and I think our, our intention has been to get them in fairly fast in the session. We just for decisions, we just need five. All right. So if, it would no no go on ahead because we still have five and, until. Excuse me, chair, I need to go. We're back next week again, I suppose. Yes, <laughs> back next week. Have we still got No, we haven't got five. Oh, we have got five, five back to Gordon. 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 Gordon, just wait for you. Are, but... Do you need five now? Well, we need five for a decision yes. if the Deputy Chair wants to suggest something. No, I, the only thing I'm suggesting is because I, I really did struggle with what Joe was saying in relation to some of those numbers, yeah. and I would like her to put in writing the context of mm -hmm. um, what she was discussing earlier uh, uh, and... Um, around those numbers from, from last year to this year and the impact and the monetary impact that it was. And she talked about the 30 million to 90 million in, in terms of international students. I'd like to know what the, those numbers are, the numbers of students that generate that amount of money. So I think if we could ask Joe to put um, that in writing so that we can have greater clarity on it. Members agreed? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, you go, Gordon. Happy days. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long distance to go. I hear it just round the corner. The yeah, so item, item number five then is the date, time, and place of next week and or next meeting. Sorry, and it will be <laughs> next week. Thanks. Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.